Good morning. Uh, can you hear me? Or do we need to pick these microphones up? <coughs> you can hear that? OK. OK. We'll make a start. I think our numbers will swell as the, as the morning progresses. Um, I think there's some problems on northern trains this morning. Um, a very warm welcome once again to Build Revolution Northwest. Um, my name is David Pierpoint. I'm the Managing Director of Osmosis. Um, we're a specialist uh, construction uh, events, networking, uh, and training company. A um, few health and safety issues be uh, and, and sort of key bits of information before we start. The toilets, I think most of you will realise, just on the right as you go out uh, here. Um, fire exits are through the main entrance, so we're not expecting any uh, fire alarms today, so please uh, make your way out if there is one. Um, could I ask you to turn your phones to uh, silent, um, but it, very importantly, could I ask you not to put them away? I would very much like you to be tweeting uh, about today's event. Um, we have some very interesting speakers with some very interesting things, so let the networks know. The hashtag you can see on the screen there is hashtag build, build rev NW Northwest. Um, so, uh, and there's a Twitter wall outside where we'll be able to see those uh, things. Um, I couldn't help but notice on the delegate list, I don't know if everyone's here, but we had some very dis distinguished guests. We've got uh, a former Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, is here, I understand. He's now working for SIG Roofing. Um, we've got Irish rugby le legend Keith Wood. Is Keith here? Um, we've got Johnny Greenwood, who's the lead guitarist from Radiohead. We've got Christopher Lee. Uh, James Whale, the radio presenter. Les Dawson is here today. And last but not least, Dudley Moore is here today. So quite a, quite a guest list. Um, please meet all these people as we go through. Um, the purpose of today's event is to help you um, you being, the majority of you being contractors or local specifiers or clients, housing associations, is to help you kickstart your, uh, your built revolution, your um, changing the way in which we do things. Um, it's the idea is you take away some practical steps will help you start that process. I'm just going to ask you now uh, to, to raise your hand if you, are, if you consider yourself currently doing digital construction, whatever that may mean to you. Okay, so a scattering of hands, more than we had in Nottingham. Okay, so clearly the Northwest is uh, is on the ball. Uh, also, how many of you are currently uh, involved in off-site construction? Okay, again a few. So the revolution may may have started already. Um, that's good to know, but I think you'll go away from today knowing much more, having much more of a sense of direction. If we if we if we haven't, then uh, then we'll have failed. Uh, so I hope you take something very powerful away from the day. Now we're here in Manchester today uh, because Manchester is usually at the <coughs> forefront of, uh, of revolutions in this country of one, shorter, one form or another, whether it's industrial or, or, or social or what have you. Um, and it's, very, uh, it's great that today we've got uh, a very key figure, um, Councillor Alex Genotis, uh, who's here to welcome you on behalf of, of the city. Uh, Councillor Genotis is the leader of Stockport Metropolitan Council. He's also the Greater Manchester lead on Green City. So without further ado, I'd ask Alex to okay. introduce. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me uh, to speak today. And can I uh, welcome you all to Greater Manchester. Um, today, I want to tell you about Greater Manchester's ambition to transition to a low uh, carbon or a carbon neutral uh, city region. I'd like to describe some of the work of the Greater Manchester Low Carbon Hub that I currently chair. Um, and I'm briefly going to outline the opportunities Greater Manchester has already created and the challenges we still face in achieving our transition to a low carbon, resilient economy. Now, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but in March of this year, Greater Manchester held its inaugural Green Summit. And the aim was to set out a new environmental vision for Greater Manchester to become one of Europe's leading green cities. And as part of this, the summit considered how Greater Manchester can accelerate its activities to reduce our carbon emissions towards carbon neutrality, to tackle climate change, position the city region as a global leader for smart energy innovation, and improve the health and quality of life for millions of people whilst protecting the environment for future generations. And the key message that both Andy Burnham and I wanted to get across at that summit 
is that we need to stop thinking about climate change as a peripheral, peripheral environmental issue and build it into mainstream thinking. And it's as much about our future economic well-being, sector development, smart, secure energy provision and people's health as it is about avoiding the damage caused by flooding and extreme weather um, events. So in our minds, there is no distinction between the green agenda in terms of what we're trying to achieve and the need for economic growth and social inclusivity and growing the jobs market. I'll give you some examples of that point in relation to your sector. Um, increasing the number of well-insulated properties will give Greater Manchester residents more disposable income will raise families out of fuel poverty and improve health and well-being outcomes for some of our most vulnerable citizens. Increasing energy and material efficiency improves productivity and profitability and reduces a company's exposure to future price volatility and availability. And this, I believe, makes companies more profitable and resilient. But importantly, these ambitions cannot be realised by local government acting alone. It will require concerted effort from national government, business and communities working together. Now, we have uh, in Greater Manchester a climate change and low emissions plan. And it outlines the critical actions that need to be taken in order to meet our headline goals. And they include major changes to our infrastructure, promoting energy efficiency in buildings, reducing fossil fuel use in transport, managing energy intelligently and supporting clean business. Now, there are two cross-cutting themes that you can see there on this slide, and they aim to realise the economic benefit of a low-carbon transition and reduce the economic risks of climate change. And with almost 3 million residents and a £56 billion economy, Greater Manchester is the largest and fastest growing regional economy in the UK. And the plan identifies actions to address uh, five headline goals that you can see there, um, including achieving our, mission, our emissions targets across seven themes. It also recognises the importance of clean air, and by the way, today is National Clean Air Day, and adds an extra objective for air quality. Now, although Greater Manchester is on track to meet its current 48% carbon reduction target by 2020, that's against 1990, uh, the 1990 baseline, we know we need to do much more to get to carbon neutral. And as for our long-term targets, we are committed to an 80 to 90% reduction by 2050. And Andy Burnham has stated his ambition to bring forward the date by which Greater Manchester can be carbon neutral by at least a decade, so 2040. And he's also set out a goal uh, to make Manchester the modern industrial capital of the UK once again. Uh, but to achieve this, we need to become a leader in those sectors which can close the productivity gap, including the energy sector. Now, here are some stats for you that you might find interesting. The low-carbon environmental goods and services sector in GM is the third largest in the UK based on sales. It employs 45,000 people, and there are nearly 2,500 companies within Greater Manchester with annual sales of £6.8 billion, showing an annual growth of 6%, and we are keen to see this grow. Now, the Greater Manchester Combined Authority has formally adopted a social value charter for use within our procurement protocols, which actively aims to support local employment and skills development. The need for innovation is urgent and our energy system is rapidly changing. The challenges of decarbonisation and ageing infrastructure and shifts in societal expectations require us to have a rethink in how we supply, manage and consume energy. Now, last year we launched an ERDF funding call for £21 million to support low carbon in our innovation in our buildings, and energy infrastructure. And the projects developed under this call will aim to stimulate innovation in energy technology, integration, distribution, management, and use. And in doing so, we're keen to adopt a place-based systematic um, approach. 
Now, devolution of powers from central government, uh, a new mayor here in Greater Manchester, and the creation of the combined authority means that these are exciting times for us in local governments. However, as Greater Manchester seeks more autonomy over the decisions that most affect our communities, it's ever more important that we base our decisions on sound evidence, not rhetoric. And Greater Manchester's success in delivering a low-carbon economy and fundamental transformation of our energy system will require us to work closely with our local universities, local businesses and network operators and draw on national expertise to understand the changes required and how best to implement them. Now, this is one of the key stats I would really like you as an audience to take away from today. The majority of the current Greater Manchester building stock will be in use by 2050. Energy used in domestic buildings accounts for 35% of the direct CO2 emissions across Greater Manchester. And energy used in commercial and industrial properties, including over 2,000 operated by the public sector, account for a further 38% highlighting the importance of increasing energy efficiency in buildings to our plans. Now, typically, 90% of building emissions arise from the energy used for space and hot water heating. And heating alone accounts for 42%. Over the next 30 years, we may well see the phasing out of gas as a primary heat source in favour of low-carbon electricity, and we need to take advantage of that now. So facilitating this transition will be key, as will the electrification of our heating and transport away from fossil fuels. Both will place an increasing burden on our electricity network, which is currently strong, but will require smarter management if we're to deal with a predicted increase in demand at peak times. Our ability to generate electricity from local renewable sources is limited currently to about 9% of future demand, vastly insufficient. However, there is the technical potential to deliver nearly 70% of our heat here in GM from local renewable supplies. By 2020, just thinking about this in the short term, Greater Manchester will, however, have established a £300 million investment pipeline of energy efficiency and low-carbon energy generation projects, prioritising solar, heat networks, heat pumps and biofuel. And there are significant opportunities for more activity with the potential to generate long-term income streams and cost savings. And that's why I think today's uh, conference is so well-timed and so important for you as a sector. Just going further on the evidence behind this, to help, uh, prove, uh, to help us plan our pathway to carbon neutrality, We've secured funding from Bayes to develop a bespoke model for Greater Manchester which could be rolled across core UK cities. And it's called the Setting City Area Target and Trajectories for Emissions Reduction, or SCATTER. And this research is the first city-level tool to set science-based carbon pathways in the UK. And it shows what is possible in, in Greater Manchester and how it's possible. And it talks about interventions for consideration by city regions, and they're broken down into four broad categories. Energy supply, energy demand from buildings, energy demand from transport, and natural capital, such as uh, for carbon uh, sequestration. And Scatter offers cities like ours a simplified suite of applications to evaluate our carbon performance and identify technical solutions to reduce our long-term impact. There is a clear demarcation of the technical solutions that can be applied locally by city region and those that rely on national measures. So with this tool, we can work out what we can do ourselves without any help and what's only possible with help. And we spent a lot of time at the Green Summit in, in March getting into the detail of this analysis. And the tool also provides city regions with the opportunity to standardise their greenhouse gas reporting to align with, acceptable, with accepted international standards such as the Compact of Mayors. But importantly about this analysis is it provides a bottom-up approach of what a feasible carbon pathway for Greater Manchester may look like. And the greatest opportunities for Greater Manchester are shown here. Pathways can then be modelled which show the impact of different levels of intervention. Only scenario four, where, where, um, 
where the most possible interventions are applied to a significant degree will get us near to a carbon neutral, neutral position by t the mid-2040s. Let me just give you a few examples of what this means, though, in terms of um, level four interventions. It would require 60% of homes to be insulated in Greater Manchester to reduce their thermal leakiness by 75%. Over 80% of homes will need to have their heating supplied by electricity uh, rather than gas, and all homes will need to cook using electric. And 50% of homes will have 16 metres square of photovoltaic cells, and a further 16 uh, kilometres squared of PV is required on commercial buildings or ground uh, or, or to be ground mounted. So you can see there are opp very clear opportunities there for your uh, sector. Just very briefly, uh, a further analysis using an energy path uh, network modelling approach in Bury, um, in North Manchester, uh, has been used for strategic spatial planning of the future energy system for that district. And it tries to answer the following questions. How would you decarbonise building energy demands at the lowest cost to society? What would you need to do where and by when. And the approach considers spatial factors, the relationship between buildings and the networks that serve them. It uses an optimization technique that tests all options and finds the lowest cost routes cutting carbon emissions. And the outputs provide evidence to aid, cons to aid consensus um, building. But we know as the combined authority and as local councils in Greater Manchester, that without strong incentives, people are unlikely to replace heating systems until they reach the end of life. And there may uh, only be two opportunities to decarbonise each building between now and 2050. And under this, we call these transitions one and two. And this analysis suggests that setting an earlier carbon target, say, 2035 does not change the final heating system solution and this model suggests a 30% move to district heating a 40% move to electric heating with the remainder staying on gas or gas hybrid but there is an increased cost over setting a 2050 target now finding innovative financial solutions to finance this transition this transition is therefore a priority for us and we're currently working with Energy Systems Catapult to test a model which proposes de developing heat as a service rather than a utility. utility. Now, in addition to our research, regulatory and strategic role, uh, Great Financial Authorities have a number of other significant roles to play, and we've seized opportunities to demonstrate leadership through the delivery of carbon uh, reduction uh, measures. There are loads on this slide, uh, but I'll just pick out two which I think would be of most interest to you. First of all, energy, improving energy efficiency in buildings is a key uh, area for action. The most important role local authorities can play in the residential building sector is through implementing home insulation measures within the context of national energy efficiency programs and local authorities also have a crucial role in increasing the resilience of buildings and infrastructure to reduce the risk of flooding as well as protecting citizens from the adverse health impacts of a changing climate and secondly district heating uh, local authorities have a unique role in developing and making decentralized heating schemes commercially viable and in terms of in, in existing pro, uh, projects, um, a selection there, I'm not going to go through them all, uh, but we are working with the uh, public, private and academic partners to develop uh, markets and encourage innovation. And we already have achieved quite a lot, as you can see from that slide. But just to pick out uh, three uh, that I think, again, would be of interest to you, we're currently working with Bayes and Energy Systems Catapult on a smart systems and heat national pilot. We continue to support energy efficiency in homes through a local energy advice program and a warm homes fund, um, an award-winning £9 million Green Deal Communities Programme and a Little Bill campaign has delivered solid wall insulation and more than uh, £10 million of eco-funding has, has been delivered to assist full, a few poor residents across Greater Manchester. And we've completed a £20 million demand-side response demonstrator of air source heat pumps across 550 social homes uh, with the new energy development organisation of the Japanese government that you may have heard about. So just by way of a conclusion, um, further work is required to accelerate our delivery of a low carbon economy and scale up our demonstration activities to become mainstream. And 
As I say, although we are on target to meet our 2020 uh, targets, we know that a business as usual approach will not get us to our long term goals. We need to adopt a green aspiration mentality and the Mayor and the Combined Authority has set goals high. It won't be without challenges. We need to significantly scale up our activities, moving from demonstration of what is possible to realising our full potential. To do this, we need to create investment frameworks which provide the capacity to develop viable projects. In particular, we need to accelerate energy efficiency in buildings and decarbonise heat as existing homes and buildings, as I say, will still account for over 56% of carbon emissions by 2035 under business as usual. So buildings are absolutely key, absolutely key, if not more so than transport, to achieving our ambitions in Greater Manchester. We also need to uh, incentivise investment by others. Now, we, we know that there will be significant infrastructure challenges to electrification of transport, heat and heat network growth. There's no easy solution. I don't want to pretend to you or make out that there is an easy solution. So we can only achieve this by creating a credible plan for people, communities and businesses and developing the potential of future devolution opportunities to strengthen local policy and create an innovative financial mechanisms because that is key, will give businesses certainty to invest in low carbon. We recognise that you need that certainty, you need that policy framework, and you need the financial incentives to develop and assist us in meeting our goals. Now, the Mayor's Green Summit in March has set us on the right track. Commitments made at the summit to investigate, for example, an energy innovation company for Greater Manchester, develop a smart energy plan, and importantly set a date by which homes will become uh, carbon neutral in Greater Manchester and explore a GM environment fund. Will, all that work will be completed this year. And it's clear that city regions like Greater Manchester have a strong and diverse role in incentivising that low carbon transition. Greater Manchester leaders are actively looking for GM authorities to work closer together and with partners like you to cost efficiently accelerate the achievement of our mutual goals. And so I hope that today's event will provide a platform for even more collaboration between Greater Manchester authorities and our businesses. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Genotis. That was uh, that was really fascinating, and it's a, a brilliant lead-in, really, to uh, our first session, which is how will construction firms be doing business in the future? How are you going to need to change? Um, and if I were in your shoes, I'd ask myself the question: um, Is this drive for change? Is it for real uh, or not? Um, the uh, direction has been set. It's been set here by a leader of a, a major uh, council um, and by Manchester itself. It's been set by all sorts of strategic reviews, one of which, of course, is the Farmer Review. We're going to hear from, from Mark in just a couple of minutes. Um, but uh, before we do that, I'll just ask you, which report is this from? See if any of you recognise it. So it's a direct extract. It says, the report cited five drivers for change, a quality-driven agenda, a commitment to people, integrated processes and teams, committed leadership, uh, and a focus on the customer. Anyone recognise which report or want to hazard a guess which report that's from? It is Egan. Roger, that's fantastic. <laughs> and that was from 1998. Now I'd ask you whether your construction firms you're involved in are doing that, whether that's happened or not, uh, and, and uh, some will and some won't. But uh, just because important people say change is important doesn't necessarily mean it happens. So is it any different this time? Mark's going to cover all of this, but I do believe we're at a crossroads, uh, an important juncture in the, in the history of UK construction, all sorts of influences upon it. And to tell us more about that, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Mark Farmer, the Chief Executive of CAST and the Co-Chair of Constructing Excellence, a national partner on this event. Obviously best known to, us, uh, to many of us as the author of the Modernise or Die report, which is intended to lay bare the skills crisis and labour shortages we will increasingly face, but it's very much become a rallying point for multiple people, multiple points, multiple um, issues around that modernised ag ag agenda. And uh, to hear more about it, introduce Mark Farmer. <coughs> okay. <coughs> uh, thank you, David. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm going to take you on a fairly rapid um, journey through what I think is happening at the moment. I'm not going to talk about my report. I'm just going to talk about what I think is happening here and now. 
um, in response to various things and not m many of those things in terms of the backdrop to why we need to change I did cover in my report but actually there are things that have happened since probably coincidentally some of them are structural change um, that I believe as David said lead us to being a, at a bit of a crossroads for the industry my belief and I wouldn't have made this statement even six months ago is that we are at last at the on the cusp of something in terms of long-lasting change in our industry and why do I say that because you're probably not feeling that at the moment and and in terms of the hands up in terms of who's doing digital construction earlier that probably verified that that we have a um, a variable speed industry with people doing different things different levels of innovation we're highly fragmented we struggle to find ways in which we connect with innovation modern um, and the modernization agenda but my firm belief is that that is going to change and I'll just set the backdrop to that in, in, in terms of the reasons. So some of this is related to this inherent um, issue we have, and it's a burning platform, and I use that term a lot, um, and it was probably the biggest underlying message of my report, which is actually we are facing into a long-term structural decline in our workforce, both in terms of the quantum of people we have in our industry, and when I talk about industry, I mean everyone, consultants, contractors, specialists, um, even in the real estate sector, we have similar problems. Um, and that is something, in terms of the volatility of employment in our industry, we, we work in a cyclical market. So the fact that employment goes up and down is something that is quite well known to um, at least us that have been through uh, economic cycles. And there's been at least two major ones in, in, in my career. Um, but what I'm um, setting out here is that there's something different at play, which is the fact that we have irrespective of the, the cyclical activity, we have a structural decline um, being driven by two issues. One is demography. We have an aging workforce. We have many more people retiring every year now than we are due to be bringing into our industry. And on that latter point, um, we are not winning the war for talent. We're not able to secure uh, enough kids coming into our industry, enough diversity in our industry. And it's not just headcount, it's talent. It is true talent, you know, the capability of people to be part of our future. Um, our industry is seen as a last resort for many people that come into our industry, and that's a good thing in, in many respects in terms of the social value that it can create and act as a safety net for many people that are on the fringes of society. But that also burdens us. And we have to look at how we improve what we do as an industry because that decline in our workforce is going to affect our ability to deliver what the economy demands us to deliver and that includes a, a variety of things including uh, housing obviously which is probably the most politicized issue at the moment also critical national infrastructure whether that's social infrastructure schools hospitals physical infrastructure railways roads etc and that's before you get onto all the commercial work that we're asked to deliver so a fun we're fundamentally faced with a productivity crisis we have to be able to prepare to do more with less and it's the productivity debate which has been covered many times before in our industry on different reports that we now need to get serious about in terms of um, reforming the ways in which we physically deliver but just to overlay on that there's some really interesting dynamics that have started to take shape in the last 12 to 15 months and part of those are exhibited in these headlines which is a series of um, uh, uh, extracts from the trade press and national press all saying the same thing that our industry is not making any money. It's either wafer thin, particularly in terms of uh, tier one main contractors, um, or actually people in a loss making position. And that obviously came to a head in January when we had the demise of Carillion. Uh, and it really brought into focus the fact that we have some really, really deep seated flaws in our, the model in which we deliver. The fact that we are cyclical has obviously driven a fragmentation in our supply chain. Subcontracting is now the way in which you deliver. Main contractors don't employ anymore in terms of tradesmen. They just have a process management layer sitting over the top. We have this massive cascade down in terms of getting to maybe four or five levels down in the supply chain to who actually does the work. Now that's fine when we have an industry that can deliver on its promises, when we can deliver to cost, time and quality. Contractors can take that kind of risk because actually within reason they can manage that risk. When you have a declining skills base and the average competency of people on, on your project or programs of work is declining and under stress, mistakes happen. And much part of what led to Carillion's demise, not in total, but a big chunk of it was problem projects, 
legacy projects, loss-making projects, that means the cash machine all of a sudden doesn't work anymore because losses crystallise on the balance sheet and you become, in this case, insolvent. So that, as a model, an operating model for our industry, I think is hugely under pressure now. I do not think that that will be fit for purpose in the years ahead as we struggle more and more to deliver what we've been doing with less and less people of the required skills and competency. And even last week, we're still getting the same headlines. So this won't go away. This is not just Carillion um, turn a page. This is for, with us for a long, long time. And then there's another level of discontent that's happening from outside the industry, which is the end consumer of our construction services is starting to fight back. And they're using media as a means, particularly in the house building industry, which is where I work, to say, do you know what? That's not good enough anymore. To have a new home that I've spent three or four hundred thousand pounds on with a snagging list of 30 pages of items is not acceptable anymore. We've worked in an industry where practical completion has meant 95% complete in many instances with a big long snagging list and then it gets done when it gets done. That is no longer good enough in the society we're in at the moment. The consumer in that market is pushing back. It's also flagging up the quality issues we have in our industry. The ability to deliver right first time um, and it, as you can see there from the headline about the Scottish Schools Programme, it's not just housing. It is social infrastructure, it's, it's physical infrastructure. So Crossrail has been held up as a massive exemplar for innovation and um, fantastic work. And it, it, don't get me wrong, it is. Some great stuff has happened on the back of Crossrail. But just when the job comes to the latter part of its completion, where it becomes a normal building construction project, you have multiple stations now being fitted out with labour intensive trades crawling all over each other. You have industrial relations disputes. You have problems attracting labour. It starts to go off the rails, literally. And it's now going to be late and it's going to be over budget. So this is not something that's just confined to little pockets of the industry. This is generic. And we do have some repeat offenders by the looks of it. What happened last summer at Grenfell Tower probably takes this to an entirely different level in terms of the focus in our industry and the systemic failures, um, the failure points that I've already exhibited. Um, you will have um, no doubt have picked up some of the findings in the Hackett Review that was published a few weeks ago, um, clearly um, illustrating a broken model. And um, uh, I, I, I would totally agree with that, talking about how do we drive a golden thread of building information into our job? So no doubt the public inquiry that's happening at the moment will, do, will uncover more of what's gone on on that project in terms of its uh, refurbishment. But what is clear to me is that the idea of how a client commissions a team to deliver, that then designs something, that then procures something, that then constructs something, the provenance of that initial decision that you made in terms of what you wanted to have as a built asset c compared to what you end up with, um, is massively difficult to unpick and um, I think we've already seen examples of what's happened at Grenfell will be down to the fact that certain things that should have been done haven't been done. I think what's really interesting as well is that government, UK um, government has reacted to some of these points in the last actually six months, six to seven months I'd say there's an acceleration of policy activity starting to wake up to the fact that if we don't have a fit for purpose construction industry in this country then the government won't be able to deliver promises that it's making in terms of home building infrastructure economic growth and wealth and these documents all have um, uh, implications in terms of how we're going to be do, doing business in the future some of them will take a bit of time to land some of them are more immediate one of the big announcements that was made by the chancellor in november was the fact that five of the biggest spending government departments in terms of public works are going to move towards a presumption of modern methods of construction by 2019. So that includes the school building programme, includes the prison programme, defence programme, hospital and health programme and transportation programme. So all of a sudden you have Clark, the government as a major commissioner of construction leading and a lot of this is about client leadership as to how we're going to change our industry. It's very difficult to change ourselves from within because we're so fragmented. All of a sudden, we have some political leadership leading into policy establishments that, um, or announcements that can fit, positively change our industry, and not just big tier one contractors and big consultants. This, in my view, will impact the whole industry. And it will take some time to trickle down, but what it's going to do is reshape supply chains. It's going to reshape how we do design and it's going to reshape how we procure. 
and link that links into the wider sector deal that you no doubt will be aware of and we might hear a bit more about that in terms of what Innovate UK are, are doing in the moment in terms of the call for um, bids for Core Innovation Hub and other things that relate to the £170 million pounds of the funding that was announced in the last budget, under the, which is now being badged as transforming construction. And again, do not think that this is something for the big tier one contractors and big specialists and the consultants to all get around the table and have all the money. I think this is a really big opportunity for the wider supply chain to get engaged, but it needs collaborative behaviour. It needs individual businesses, small businesses, to get together and actually to, to want to do this. And I think that's a mindset issue more than anything else. It's not about your balance sheet or your turnover or how many people you employ. It's about your willingness to engage. Just following on from the previous um, uh, speech, there was, uh, the, there was an announcement about three or four weeks ago by the Prime Minister, which linked into the wider industrial strategy, that there's now a commitment from the government to half energy use of new buildings by 2030. You've already heard that the devolution agenda, no doubt, will accelerate elements of that where towns and cities and combined authorities will want to push forward on that agenda. It's quite clear GMCAR, London's doing something similar. Um, this will have an impact on how we build as well. It will have an impact on how we design, how we build, how we run our buildings as, as completed assets. So all of that for me means a couple of things. At a time when we're going to have downward pressure on our workforce, there's going to be upward pressure on how much process we have to drive into our industry. The average skill level of everyone, not just new people, people in the industry at the moment, have to start reskilling and upskilling. And the competency requirements that we need to deliver <coughs> high quality construction with less people will all change and be, there'll be upward pressure on that. And there'll be increased compliance and enforcement through regulatory change, particularly on the back of building regulation reform that will have come out of the Grenfell uh, tragedy and other stuff that happens. And that, for me, means we have to integrate ourselves as an industry. That subcontracting point that I mentioned, where we're all working within a massive cascade, a Ponzi scheme type scenario, has to change. Because people will be unable to take risks for other people's performance and it will increasingly be a business risk that will potentially send people under, just like Carillion. And that is in turn going to force a greater focus on use of technology, and I'll come on to that, and it's going to increase a greater focus on how we turn construction more into a manufacturing sector. And I don't mean all of a sudden we're doing things on um, production lines with robots. It's not all about that. Manufacturing is a process, and it's the process bit that I'm focusing on in terms of injecting more process into what is a very... Um, unprocessed light -like industry at the moment. If you look at things like BIM, and lots of people will talk very passionately about BIM, building information modelling, what I see at the moment is a model that doesn't work. I see digital design being bolted on to a fairly traditional procurement and construction process. So I see 3D um, Revit models or whatever they might be, lots of designers working up front to, to, to embrace digital, clash detecting and coordinating their models and then passing them through a competitive procurement process to contractors who have variable levels of digital um, uh, enablement, then go into site and you build it in a normal way, analog. So that digital thread or the golden thread that Hackett's talking about is not there at the moment. We do not take digital from the front to the back of our jobs. In, in a large amount of the front just diminishes as we, as we run through our jobs. And I think all of this, what I've just said, means innovation, the wider angle of innovation, is going to increasingly be the, for, the, the, the key word for our industry going forward, something that's been a dirty word for, for many, many years, too, too many years, but now I think it's going to change. Innovation is about actual implementation. It's not about good ideas. It's doing stuff. And that innovation has to lead to better outcomes, um, whether that's about technical build quality, whether that's structural performance, integrity of buildings. You know, we've already seen examples where our buildings are literally falling down. We've got buildings being condemned within the defects liability period, down to poor design and, and workmanship. Whether it's cosmetic finish, quality of the, the look and feel of your buildings, whether it's technology enablement, such as Wi-Fi and light, which is going to increasingly be part of our buildings, whether it's energy performance and the performance gap we know exists in terms of what we think we're going to be doing with the energy efficiency of our buildings compared to when they're actually measured, they're way off. And some of that is, again, down to build quality. We're also, at a macro level, increasingly going to get into the smart cities agenda. And the idea of the internet of things, connected buildings, infrastructure, um, artificial intelligence, all of these things are going to have impacts on how we build. 
even SMEs building single buildings, single houses, small commercial buildings, this is going to become part of the agenda we will have to respond to. And innovation also has to react to the customer. So I've already highlighted the discontent we're, we're seeing from our end uh, customers in our industry. We need to move ourselves more towards the likes of the automotive industry that has transformed its interface point with the customer. And I think that will be forced on us because I can see a world within five years, certainly, of us all being rated. The TripAdvisor culture, which you're very used to seeing in hotels and restaurants and the sort of retail world, I think will be coming into our industry and it will come into most industries. It happens in automotive as well and, in, and, and lots of other sectors. We've managed to push that off, get away with what we've been doing as a highly variable outcome. I don't think that will be allowed anymore because actually the tools available for people to give feedback are going to be so powerful that if you do not deliver, you will go out of business. It's as simple as that. And that sounds quite stark and it sounds quite disturbing, but it's, the, it's that stimulus for change that I think we need to aspire to do something differently. We haven't had that in the past. It's been like, we'll just carry on as we are and it'll be all right. But I think that's a new driver for change in itself. We'll also be forced to organise. I've covered this. I'm not going to go over this. This is the sort of Carillion-esque lump sum model. All the waste that sits in there with overheads and profit on overheads and profit and risk transfer. Um, it's a complete mess in terms of for every pound spent um, only 51 pence is actually going on the end asset the rest of it is management fees overheads and profit risk transfer so we need to disintermediate that model we need to get the people that want the work done closer to the people doing the work with less people in between doing things that are non-value add in procurement terms there's lots of initiatives at the moment i'm not going to dwell on this and many of you will know some of these um, uh, publications that are out there as a rallying call to the industry to procure differently critically important that clients and consultants advising their clients embrace this it's really difficult for the industry the supply chain to push something unless the client is asking for something differently i've talked about the move to manufacturing we are in a very low productivity industry a lot of what we do is complete um, uh, rework we have to go back and do um, do things twice or more we have non-productive time on site through mismanagement through the lack of coordination and management that leads us to be one of the lowest production industries um, in all sectors and this move to manufacturing is a subtle one it's not just about modular many people will be aware of modular construction as being one route to how we move construction to manufacturing and that's a very valid route and lots of people are doing that quite rightly but manufacturing is more a component level it's standardization it's designed for manufacturer assembly it's including the likes of sub-assembly component working that rather than just put everything together at the work face you do more in a controlled environment prior to its fitting at the final work face and that is a design-led issue it's one again that, just, that links to how, uh, how how clients commission their teams how design is design and how the manufacturing supply chain can react respond to that lots of good work happening in this area not enough spread across industry yet but i suspect this might be coming and i think it's good it's good not just for large businesses it's good for smes we're also starting to see the beginning of artificial intelligence come into our industry um, and this is an example of a uh, generative design program so many of you will know the likes of things like dynamo um, or grasshopper which are generative design bolt-ons to bim these do high level iterations or high speed iterations of design optimization that enable you to design entire shapes of buildings and massing and and even the, the detail of the buildings um, through a parametric program and if you bolt that onto a manufacturer supply chain like this guy here who runs a dutch developer contractor business not particularly large it's not quite an SME but it's somewhere in between all of a sudden you can design a building from a site that's made available to him to a manufactured supply chain that sits behind the design the computer comes up with with a price that's already assembled because the supply chain is pre-assembled and has all of the prices pre-agreed and you go to site with an order book that's already been made because you press the button and the order goes to all the manufacturers it's complete end-to-end -end. and we're starting to see the beginnings of this in the UK so this is uh, Swan Housing some of you will be aware it's a housing association in, um, in, the, in the south of England uh, they've built a digital configurator tool they have their own factory they're allowing customers to mass to to customize their home not just the color of the worktop or the the color of the paint the actual shape of the building 
the facades that go on the building, the number of bedrooms, and all of that links to a manufacturing ordering tool that goes to their factory that then puts the building together or, or cuts all the components. You will see more and more of that come into our world. And then this point about SMEs, and many of you will be SMEs in the room, I suspect. This, this all sounds a little bit far-fetched. It all sounds a little bit, yeah, it's the, t it's the big guys that are going to be part of this agenda. My view is it's not. It's completely inclusive. We're, I'm seeing some really interesting examples of small businesses engaging with this agenda just because they have the right mindset. It's nothing to do with how many people they have or what their turnover is. It's actually they want to get engaged with innovation. A lot of this is actually happening in Scotland where there's a really interesting buzz to do things differently. Carbon Dynamic is an SME business that's embraced modular manufacturing. It's using augmented reality, virtual reality. It's this it's mind blowing how much how wrong you can be thinking that this is just what the legal and generals of this world would be doing in half a million square foot factories in Yorkshire. It's this is completely across the piece. Some of you might have heard of WikiHouse. This is where it becomes interesting around reshaping the supply chain. Small builders, one man bands turn up um, and rather than go to a builder's merchants can be ordering components from open source manufactured um, um, solutions that basically is like a big IKEA house being put together by your small builders who currently lay a brick on a brick or a wiring a house or a, uh, or a carpenter or a joiner putting various bits together into the house. The, the, the basic reskilling required for this is not significant and it completely changes the ability to make money. You can be more profitable. Um, and that is where I see the world of things like the conventional builders merchants changing into something quite different around consolidated components and open source manufacturing. And I'll close, conscious of time, I think we're, we're over. Now, there's a wider piece here about, it's not about construction, it's about the future. Many of you might have heard of the, uh, the concept of the future of work. And it's something I um, keep quite close to because as a, uh, someone who runs my own business and I'm an SME, I'm 55 people, started with seven people two and a half years ago, so I know the pressures of an, being an SME, things are changing out there. The next generation of workers are different. You know, people talk about millennials, you know, Generation Z is after millennials. It's going to be even more different. They all have different aspirations. They have different views on what they want to do, their loyalty to businesses, the, the, the things they would, that, that actually get them interested and motivated. And it's all going to be about technology. It's going to be about how we all use technology in our businesses to augment what we do with human expertise. And lots of people are concerned that that's just about mass unemployment, technological unemployment. My view is that actually it will coexist, but we need to retrain ourselves and reskill ourselves. If we sit there and just think it's not happening, we face the risk that our businesses will not be fit for the future. And we will, if you don't modernize, you die. And that was the rallying call that I made. It wasn't about the industry, it was about individual businesses, that if you don't embrace this, it's gonna be increasingly difficult to get on the front foot and see where your competitors are going. Um, I haven't got time to go through um, all of this in terms of skills, but what you're gonna see potentially is some big steps, not incremental change. You're gonna see some big steps in, what, in some of the technology that comes into construction. There's two I would pick, point out, um, uh, particularly one is AI artificial intelligence you're going to be hearing more and more about this in the mainstream you probably are already picking it up in the press and on television day after day this is coming into our industry there's some fascinating stuff that is being innovated as we speak the other is augmented reality not virtual reality augmented reality the reason i picked that out is that the sort of tools that are being developed at the moment here in the uk in some world leading facilities with innovate uk support actually i would add are going to be accessible to everyone in the industry including your one-man band builder on site putting things together so gone will be the, the, the days of using a tape measure to set out or even a field light um, uh, level you'll have a digital model displayed in front of you with a microsoft hololens on as part of your everyday routine to deliver buildings and that's the level of change <coughs> that will bring digital to the work face going back to that digital thread as soon as you're able to deliver the digital at the point of the, the delivery of the, the finished products and it's videoed because there will be a digital record of how it gets put together through the Microsoft Hello Lens and if you add a, a helmet cam on it, then you change your industry. And that's where I see the future. That's where I see the, the challenge for everyone in their own businesses in our industry to move forward. Uh, and that's why I say that I think change is finally here whether we like it or not, it's technology actually that will drive this probably more than the discontent 
um, and we have to get with it. If we don't get with it, then we're going to get left behind. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was, uh, was really fascinating, Mark. I think um, we did a survey with our delegates before the event uh, to see where they are with various different kinds of technology. And it might be interesting to know that in terms of things like artificial <coughs> intelligence and augmented reality, very few people were looking at that at the moment. Um, so perhaps it's something that, you know, if you believe Mark's argument, personally, I think you should. So maybe you should look more, more closely at it again. Um, we're going to make up some time uh, later in the day. This is a key session, so uh, we'll, uh, we'll crack on with uh, Sarah. Um, Sarah is the uh, uh, head of Smart Infrastructure Innovate UK, um, has responsibility within the clean growth and infrastructure sector group uh, for the built environment portfolio. Uh, and uh, I'll leave it to Sarah to uh, carry on. Hi everyone. Um, as uh, David said, I'm from Innovate UK uh, in the smart infrastructure team and, and we're doing a lot around digitising construction, um, improving construction techniques. But today I'm going to talk about the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, Transforming Construction, um, which is a massive project that we're undertaking over the next four years. We have $170 million of government money and a commitment to help industry build safer, healthier, more affordable, more energy efficient buildings. So how we're doing that is we're focusing on three key areas. How we actually manufacture buildings, how we design and manage them, um, and how we power them. I think, probably won't labour this too much, uh, Mark's really uh, alluded to why we need to change low productivity, uh, skills shortage, um, we've got building um, performance issues with buildings use, using up to four times as much as they were designed to. Uh, the government has a, a large commitment of infrastructure in their pipeline and if, if projects are running over time and over costs, that's, that's not great. So why are, we, why are we focusing on whole life value as part of this? I think a lot of us focus on the capex. Uh, it's a bit about that procurement for lowest costs. If, you, if, you, if you're trying to cut corners, you end up with subcontractors replacing high quality items for cheaper, less, less good ones. Um, but actually, when you look at the cost breakdown, a lot of the costs in buildings are during their operation, their energy use, um, and also the service proposition. Our buildings are supporting our economy, our workforces, um, hospitals, schools. If you can actually focus on that service provision and, and outcomes in when you're procuring uh, services, building services, uh, you could have a huge impact. If you could increase the productivity of your workforce by 10% over the life of that building or reduce the amount of time people spend recovering from operations. That's huge. So how do you actually bring that thinking into this CapEx stage? Can we spend a bit more here and do that a lot better to, to maximise the, the benefits? Why are we focusing on energy? I think Alex uh, really hit this on the head. That blue line at the top that goes up and down is gas uh, over the economy. Um, the red line is electricity. It, electricity is going to decarbonise um, and is pretty steady, but it's that heating and cooling load that buildings actually uh, contribute to um, contribute significantly to. So, looking at how we en uh, how we prov provide the energy for the buildings is really important as part of the work we're doing. Uh, so, how are we going to do it? We're going to bring construction manufacturing energy, the digital sectors together, take learnings from all of those to actually look at that build, manage, power um, paradigm. I think Mark's sort of talked about this already, but off-site manufacturing is a big focus of, of what we're going to fund. Uh, let's standardise modular, modular components 
that's not saying we're going to repeat, have buildings that look exactly the same. It's about standardising the process and then layering digital on top of that so we can repeat it and make it easier across the whole life of the building. Uh, one of the things uh, as part of the program we're going to do, construction platforms, you've got products that you can pick and play with in your design. Um, you could have a, you know, I want a wall that's this R value, this size, and manufacturers can, can actually plug and play their products into, into that and meet your quality um, requirements. So where, at the moment, probably down the, the bottom left here, uh, the traditional, every house and building we build is essentially a prototype. Uh, the volumetric, you know, demountables, very repeatable. We probably don't want, want our buildings to all look like that. Um, down here we've got the uh, components but bespoke solutions. We want to we want to sort of be up there that manufactured, the processes are standardised. So we're not in reinventing the wheel each time we design a building, um, but we actually have bespoke solutions. Uh, as I mentioned, we're going to have platforms on how uh, we, how all those components interact and, and we can define how we manufacture um, the buildings. I think this is a report that's shown up in Mark's presentation as well. Uh, and then using the digital system around this, we can actually create uh, a new e ecosystem that, that can integrate different parts of the supply chain, the design team, the suppliers, into this integrated platform. Um, so we're all speaking the same language, uh, looking at the same digital model. Uh, BIM standards, that's, that's part of what we're going to look at. Uh, how, how can we um, d develop them in a way that will facilitate um, offsite manufacturing? This is just an example of a off-grid building in Wales at this specific site. It's a, um, what's it called? The school, is it, yeah. The classroom. The classroom, yes. Active classroom. Active classroom, thank you. So on the roof, they have integrated PV. Uh, on the other side of the building that we can't see, there's actually some black panels that capture heat from the air. So power in Wales, uh, the heat, um, and keep that building warm. And there's so much energy they actually uh, need electric vehicles to, to get rid of it. So um, that's a really good example of how you can uh, power your buildings. Um, what we'd like to achieve is you know, faster delivery, lower cost, lower emissions, um, improving exports. That's something Innovate UK is often focusing on. How has this off-site manufacturing worked in practice? Uh, Lang O'Rourke had a schools program. They actually built about 70% of the school off-site. They saw 20% uh, less staff were needed on-site to assemble it, 66% um, productivity improvement. You can see if, particularly if you're in a place like in a central CBD area, uh, London, if you can reduce the time on site to assemble and, and prevent disruption, then you're, you're doing pretty well. So the policy context, we're not, Innovate UK has not just decided to do this. Um, there is, I think, a tide of change. We've got the transforming infrastructure performance, as Mark talked about. The government is committing to, to change how they procure, which I think is huge. Uh, we've got, the government is restricted in what they can actually do if they don't change. So to, to just keep the education department going, they need 400 schools, replacement schools, to just maintain the existing stock. And then we need about 2,000 new primary schools. So they're not, they don't have the, the skills the, the workforce doesn't have the skills to actually deliver this, so that's, uh, they're really re-looking really at how they're, how they're going to manage their $650 million pipeline of projects. 
So we've got the the uh, infrastructure project um, project authority, as I talked about. We've also got the construction <coughs> leadership council. There will be a sector deal, and then we've got the Innovate UK and um, the research councils are also involved in this transforming construction thing. So we have a, a three-tier approach, which I think means that it, it's more likely to be successful. So what are we actually doing? Uh, we are setting up two hubs. So we've got a core innovation hub who will be looking at that manufacturing and digitization of buildings. Um, and then we're going to have an active building center who are going to look at um, actually demonstrating a building, how you can integrate heating, um, energy supply technologies into a demonstrator project. Within uh, the core innovation hub, they're going to look at those, the, what I talked about in terms of uh, BIM standards, the, the online platforms and um, standardization across uh, across components. Across all of that, we are going to fund some collaborative research and development and research programs to, to bring in um, research thinking on how we, how we can actually justify uh, doing this and, and those productivity outcomes of the building themselves, um, and also CR&D that is business-led. We, the, the Core Innovation Hub and the Active Building Center, we recently had a uh, competition. We haven't announced it yet, but we're hoping they'll be set up by August. So we've got some really tight objectives and targets uh, around what we're trying to achieve with the program. Um, obviously, anything that just can increase the adoption of digital manufacturing, we don't want just one project. We want that to be a scalable, um, adoptable thing by industry. Uh, obviously, uh, productivity improvements, um, we're targeting 15%, but if it could be more, that would be fabulous. Um, scalable approaches, as I said, active buildings, reducing the cost and whole life performance of the asset. We will have our first uh, CR&D competition released in July, so that is open to SMEs and, and industry, mix of 12 and 24 month projects, so we, we really would like to see people getting out there and, and doing it. Uh, really need to address those objectives I talked about um, and be business led. The research call also is going to come out in July, a bit of a bit longer, up to 36 months for those projects, uh, looking at people that can bring in different disciplines, um, you know, social research, uh, not just uh, physical, just what, how, how we can better understand the benefits that our buildings bring and feed into, into that core innovation hub. Uh, and Hopefully, uh, we should have this month the Construction Network Plus call uh, that will really help industry link into that core innovation hub and the active building centre, possibly looking at doing secondments across those, sharing information, feeding into the development of the standard processes. We'll also have some future calls next year, end of 2019, um, more CR&D, again, business-led. So there is quite a lot of opportunities um, in the next couple of months for industry to get engaged, so please do consider um, looking us up, applying. I'm here till I've got to leave at about one, but come and have a chat to me. I'm happy to answer all your questions around that. Thank you. <coughs> Sarah, thank you very much for that and for helping us catch up for a bit of time too. Just, uh, <laughs> that's great. Um, delighted to uh, say we've now got some time for um, a 
panel discussion, uh, some questions from the floor. Uh, so get your thinking caps on. Uh, I do have a few here in reserve, but I really don't want to have to use them because we're here to address your questions today. Um, but if you could just join me quickly in thanking all of our speakers there for their presentations uh, in the usual way, uh, whilst we do that. Thank you. Okay, so uh, if you could just say who you are, uh, where you work, uh, and uh, put your question. We'll, uh, we'll t take a couple and then we'll put them to the panel. Who would like to go first? Uh, yeah, Mariah. Yeah. Hi, I'm Mariah and I work for QBOT, a um, robotics company from London. Um, so, the skills um, shortage has been mentioned, I think, a couple of times in, in both presentations. So, I think it's a question to both of you. Um, I, just from a practical point of view, cannot find carpenters, builders, um, the usual problem. Um, so my question is, how can we resolve that? There's obviously a lot of money out there at the moment for research, innovation, all of that. That's really, really good. But what I'm missing is sort of a major employment in initiative in the sector, you know, where we all pull together and where uh, training gets accredited, the career path needs to be developed, I think, in, in, you know, with the digital transformation happening. I don't see that at the moment. So I'm wondering what are your ideas about this at the moment? Okay, that's fine. We'll take one more question and come back to that. So, so Charlie. Uh, Charlie Baker, Red Property with you, Retrofits and Strategies in Greater Manchester. But I've just finished a, a finance report for West Midlands, and the it's, it's on the skills issue, but about whether we need much, it chimes with what uh, Councillor Gnocchi said as well, whether we need to have much more direct involvement from the public sector to create enough certainty and ongoing pipelines of work so that we can then have the much longer gestation of building that skilled workforce up so that we know it's going to happen because I can I know we can do it if we can find the people um, we need 55,000 jobs in Greater Manchester alone to deliver the retrofit and renewable fitting program that would deliver us from uh, would deliver the targets but absolutely no trajectory to get there currently okay I think they're both part of the same question really so I'm going to come to Mark to respond <coughs> Um, so if I'm really honest, I think the skills landscape in construction is still a bit of, bit of a mess at the moment. So CITB obviously um, uh, got um, a triennial consensus vote last year, which means that in effectively industry voted for it to continue. And there was a ITB review that talked about what it had to do to reform, uh, to, to change, to make sure we have a future-proofed industry in terms of its skills and training base. Um, and there's some good stuff happening. And I can see some stuff happening in terms of a direction of travel, which is about um, looking at future skills. And my own particular focus is on future skills, not just continuing as we are. We need both. We need to evolve uh, a new s a series of career families that embrace digital, because that's a training need in itself, um, as well as making sure that we're, we're continuing to, um, uh, to, to, to train in a high quality way craft when in terms of the traditional artisan trades professional skills as well it isn't just about construction workers on site it's it's all of the built environment professionals um, but I I, sit, I, I I share your frustration and your your, your observations there absolutely ring, ring true with me um, and I think this it goes back to my point about the generational shift that's happening as well because my fear in all of this is that we can get organized and you know we can accredit courses which is taking too long by the way to the um, terms of apprenticeship uh, standards um, but if the kids don't see construction as a desirable career then we're just going to be sort of hoinking people out at 16 and dragging them in like press ganging that's not a good start for us we want people to see it as an aspirational career and that's both traditional working and futuristic working and probably everything in between and that's our biggest challenge is getting kids who generationally are not seeing they're, de they're, de they're decreasingly seeing construction as a career they want to be involved with we've got to turn that and I think lots of the things around the modernisation agenda, if we can get that right and we can speak with, with as much of, as one voice as possible, then we, and we go into schools at a much earlier point in terms of influencing kids as well, not at 14, 15, 16 year olds, but like eight, nine years old, and talk not about what we do now, but we'll talk about what we're gonna do in five, 10 years time. And all the stuff I, I shared about technology enablement and how even craftsmen on site, artisan tradesmen and craftsmen will be using technology. So that for me is the bit the biggest challenge, and I think you know some of the the barriers, the institutional barriers in terms of the Institute for Apprenticeships accreditation has been a nightmare, not just for construction, that hasn't worked. And government, I think, hopefully, are getting that message. T levels 
has been really, really tricky in terms of just getting traction. Um, and we just we do need to have those courses accredited and out there before we even think about the bigger challenge of getting kids in. Okay. Can I come in on the, the point about the role of the uh, public sector? I think you're absolutely uh, you're absolutely right there. There is more that the public sector needs to do, and the public sector also needs to be better coordinated uh, on this agenda. Now, Greater Manchester is developing a uh, local industrial strategy. Uh, so quite apart from what the national industrial strategy might be, we're developing our own based on what we think the needs of our population are, are, what we think the needs of our businesses are, and importantly, how the economy and jobs are going to change so that we can equip, especially young people, uh, for the future. Because we, we, as a country, we have a, we have a poor record, especially in, in, in vocational jobs, and, and that has to change. So unless, unless we as public sector change in terms of our role in, in skilling up people and providing em employment opportunities, we will, we will fail young people as well as, as, well as uh, f uh, failing on the uh, green um, agenda. We, the skills um, agenda is a large area of the devolution deal to, to Greater Manchester. From, 19, from 2019 to 2020, we will have control over the adult education budget here in uh, Greater Manchester. We want to go much further and have control over the post-16 education market, and there are conversations taking place with government um, on that. You may be aware that last uh, week, um, all the uh, city region mayors got together, cross-party gathering of uh, politicians to call for uh, city regions to have greater say over the spending of the apprenticeship levy. You'll be aware of, you'll, be, you'll obviously be aware of concerns about how that's being implemented in practice and how we can make sure that money goes as far as possible and to the right people. I think we have a bigger role to play there, uh, whether the government wants us to uh, or not. Um, we're currently undergoing Greater Manchester what's called the area-based review, which is a fundamental review of uh, 16 to 18 education, uh, whether or not we have direct control over what's provided in terms of uh, where it's provided, uh, understanding what the needs are of the population of Greater Manchester and providing a curriculum that will serve the needs of our young people and for the economy. That isn't about asking, necessarily asking about young people what they want, it's about us taking the impetus in providing the opportunities that we believe that young people need. And I think the construction industry is absolutely key to that. You will see the construction industry being a key part of our local uh, our, our local industrial uh, strategy. We need to tie, the, the, the green agenda is being tied into this. So although I'm the green city lead, the green agenda and the requirements of the green agenda cannot be seen in isolation. What we're talking about in terms of the needs of the economy, the needs of skills, the needs of our young people have to be tied into this wider thing. I would encourage all of you to have a look at the Greater Manchester Strategy, which was published um, last autumn, and it covers all of these areas. And it's basically where do we want Greater Manchester to be in 10 to 20 years' time, and how do we get there? And it covers all the things that you talked about um, in your questions. This is a, a really, really important agenda for us. I should also mention, as the leader of a council, that you'll be aware that local government has been really hit hard by austerity. Uh, we have lost over a third of our budget um, since, since 2010. And our response, certainly as a council to that, instead of just cutting services from people who need them, we're working intelligently on reducing people's need for those services in the first place, so that we're not pulling the rug from under them. And for me, the skills agenda and the education agenda and creating jobs and opportunities and having councils act as facilitators of business as opposed to for so long they've been seen as a source of red tape or, an organ or something that gets in the way of people. As far as I'm concerned, this isn't just good for the reasons I've set out. It also helps us meet our own agenda of cutting our costs in response to austerity by creating opportunities and creating jobs so that people are less reliant on public services, less reliant uh, on costs to the uh, public sector. So we need to think much more intelligently about all of this and bring it all together. Okay. Just a follow-on question that I think I'm going to put to you, Sarah. It, to what degree is this uh, joined up in government terms? So is there communication, for example, between CITB and Innovate UK around it? Uh, I know it's a very complex, multiple department, multiple organisation, uh, stakeholder uh, set, but uh, how's that working? Obviously, uh, the skills uh, shortage was part of the reason that we were able to justify this programme. Um, unfortunately, there hasn't been a specific uh, amount for skills. Um, I personally haven't been working with the CIBT. I, I'm not sure if my colleagues are. I, I can follow up on that. 
Um, but yeah, I, I think it is. Well, so clearly somewhere there's some joined up thinking going on, which I think maybe is largely down to Mark's, the impact of Mark's so just, just to answer that, so the part of the core innovation hub strategy will be to develop skills. So certainly one of the bids I've seen, which is the one that's based on the Manufacturing Technology Centre in Coventry, um, has a CITB component in terms of teaching new, or firstly coming up with new course accreditation standards at MVQ 3 plus level, which is about digital engineering, digital assembly, digital logistics. So moving to manufacturing, what does that mean around retraining existing um, uh, uh, professionals and tradesmen and then people coming into the industry so there is a little bit of joined up thinking there you, you'll be glad to hear but Great. we need to make all of this stuff happen at the moment there's too much stuff that's sitting up there on, <coughs> as, power, as powerpoint slides rather than mm. the reality yeah. okay great time for one more question if anyone would like to uh roger a lot of our discussion there has been about skills which is very important because we are losing skills in the industry um it was interesting i was reading a talked about attracting youth in, but I think there's almost a question of you know, how, how are we hanging on to our workforce. There was a report by PwC recently, I think they do an annual report, I think it's called the Golden Age, and we are one of the worst countries in terms of retaining people beyond 55. I mean, I was absolutely amazed. It was something like 62%, we retain 62% people beyond 55, whereas New Zealand it's something like 85%. <coughs> So I'm not sure whether that's typical of the construction industry as well. But we've also got to find a way of keeping people in this industry longer. Uh, and it, it might be that you know what we're looking at here, which is absolutely brilliant, you know, support from digital uh, robotics or cobotics, you know, people people working longer with all, and retaining all the skills in the industry, uh, using robotics to support what they're doing to make them quite capable of. Staying in the industry as, as I hope to do well into my sort of towards my 70s. Um, interestingly, I was also reading coincidentally, Toyota is starting to introduce people back onto the production lines, working alongside robots, because actually they find that that intelligence, that human uh, intelligence alongside the robot, can improve efficiency and reduce defects. So I think there's a great opportunity for me to think about you know, the retention of. Yeah, I, I actually think the the move towards integrating digitization, virtual reality, all these cool, new, exciting things um, will help with that. Uh, I think you're going to be able to engage young people in the industry, and it, it's a more of a creative uh, venture. If you can, if you can, uh, and once they're in, they can probably see that there's a lot of options. And I think if you, but, but I'm also interested in the older generation myself who are still very excited about what's going on in the industry and I've been in it 50 years and you know it, it is a great time to be in the industry and, and personally I want to be in a, a lot longer because it is so very exciting so it, it's, it's the whole perspective across the, the whole spectrum right across the industry I think particularly not to lose the skills that we've already got. So I, I think there's two aspects to that one is we we tend to lose people and this is not necessarily age dependent, this is economic cycle dependent. So we always bleed expertise and skills when we have a downturn and we shed labour, particularly because we have a high level of um, self-employment in our, in, in our uh, uh, workforce. Um, and that, that begs the question as to how we better we get better at demand planning, which is a, there's a role for government in that in terms of putting a floor under minimum demand using government spend programmes as a big tool of policy to ensure that if the private sector stops building, we're still building other stuff and particularly infrastructure and housing. The piece about ageing, I absolutely identify with. You know, I think there's, there's, there's various, various elements to this. Part of it is the physicality. If you're working on, on site, it's quite, um, it's quite demanding. And you know, physically, so a lot of people get to 55, and if they're not in management or supervisory positions, they have to give up. And the, obviously, I hear countless stories of, of, of that type. And it, you're absolutely right. I think the, the way in which digital technology and manufacturing can then re energize and retain that workforce is now there. There's, there's, there's examples I see already of people that are setting up more sort of factory based ventures that are re employing people that have left the industry as tradesmen. You know, some of them are carrying injuries, either back injuries through manual handling or whatever, that are now back on the production line. 
actually you know, absolutely part of the future. They were energised, they didn't want to have to give up in the first place um, and a great opportunity. The other opportunity for people that um, are of an older generation is to be part of our training solution as well. There's not enough people go from working in, in, in the industry to then going into FE or HE as to actually transfer their skills to the next generation. Um, and you know, there's all sorts of reasons for that, but there's a great opportunity for that, that, that skills transfer to be sort of industrialised as well. Any final thoughts? I think, um, obviously I'm not an expert in your section in, in, in relation to employment, but there is, a, there is a general issue in the economy uh, about people leaving the employment market earlier than, than elsewhere. Um, what I worry about is that when you see these fantastic uh, stories about how unemployment is at a record low, well, that generally is, a, is, is measured on people who are looking for work, uh, people who, who, who leave the job market and are no longer looking for work, aren't necessarily classed as unemployed, and we need to have regard to those people and make sure that those skills, uh, that the skills they have are harnessed as best as possible, and indeed uh, ensure that people can uh, change careers because we no longer need to assume that people will have a career for life. Increasingly, there are people in their 40s and 50s who, who, who to get on, will need to radically change what they do and, and radically change their skill set. So one of the important things about devolution and the devolution of the adult education budget, budget to Greater Manchester from 1920 will very much be focused on people, I believe, in their 40s and 50s, because until you get to your 40s, your your you're still benefiting, I think, from the education that you, you and, and training that you had when you were when you were younger. And we're going to need to very much focus on the points that you're talking about across the economy once we get those devolved powers in a year, year or so's uh, time. The other point, of course, is that the pension age is increasing and increasing and increasing. I think for people my age, it will be at least uh, 68. Um, so, ha so, so how do we re reduce the cost on the public sector of both an ageing uh, population and the fact that we don't perform very well in terms of when, when people tend to leave the jobs market? It's, it's a really important agenda for us in, in Grace Mansion, and I do think that devolution will go some way to address those points. But we have to work with industry. And, and, and lots of organisations in various industries get the point about the benefit of recruiting and retaining older staff because there is proof that they are more loyal, they are more skilled, they commit more to organisations and, importantly, have an important role to play in terms of inspiring young people who come into your organisation. So as I say, I don't know a great deal about, um, about, about your industry in that context, but on a GM level across the economy, it's something that's going to be very much a part of our agenda over the next couple of years. Thank you very much. In the next session, we're going to explore whether you're all going to be replaced by robots or not. Um, I think the good news is you're not, um, as I understand it. Um, that brings us to the end of this session. Um, uh, I'd like to once again thank all the speakers. It's been really fascinating. Um, uh, we're going to have about 20, 25 minutes now. Um, it's part break, but it's a working break, okay, because um, our exhibitors are offering um, some technical clinics on uh, subjects that may, should be of interest to you. We should all have a sheet uh, which has got those listed on. If not, pick up one from the registration desk. Um, we'll make a quick announcement when they're about to start. Uh, many of you also picked up a little booklet on the way in with a few meetings, a few people we suggest you might like to, uh, to have a conversation with based on uh, what you've told us about yourselves. So please do that uh, during the break if you have one of those. We'll be back here uh, at around about quarter to 12. Uh, when we'll be looking at uh, the opportunities and also the possible red herrings around digital and off-site construction. So moving from the why should we modernise to the how we might go about doing that. So, but uh, please once again join me in thanking our speakers. It's been fascinating. Thank you. Okay, we're, we're going to make a start because otherwise we're going to get very behind time and people are clearly going to come through when they've uh, finished their chats and their coffees. Um, so we now have, uh, whoops, we now have two clinics um, on digital construction and off-site construction. And I've just, <laughs> just ignore this. There you go. Uh, 
the first of these clinics is led by uh, Matt Comer, who you see up on stage, who's uh, a specialist in digital transformation. I wish I was. That's a much better job title than mine. Uh, an independent expert specialising in advancements that shape our urban and built environments. Um, Matthew, you get Matt, rather. With one T, you're going to talk to us about digital construction. Uh, thanks very much, David. Um, yeah, so the, what I'm going to try and do over the next 15 or 20 minutes is uh, demystify what we mean by digital construction and digital transformation, try and make it a little bit more practical and relevant about how you can do it. The previous um, presentations were quite, uh, you know, high level, big thinking, you know, industrial strategies, government, um, government work. There's stuff happening right now, and there's a lot of these uh, phrases that go around. The great thing about working in digital transformation is that you can just make up words, basically. It's pretty much what we do on a daily basis. So what I'm actually going to try and do is uh, make some of these phrases and some of these technologies more understandable, uh, explain what's actually happening at the moment, and then lastly finish up on uh, practical steps that you can uh, undertake and you can do now. So as I said, firstly, it's probably a little bit of time for buzzword bingo. We do like a little buzzword in, uh, in any kind of digitization process. Um, I, uh, there's no prizes. You're not going to get anything. But it's a, uh, we do really, really um, try and make things more complicated than they actually are. And really what I want to try and get to across today is that in terms of digital construction, all we really mean is it's about transparency. It's about quality, it's about speed, and it's about repeatability. Those are the four things that we're trying to achieve when we talk about digitization of the construction sector, um, when we talk about um, improving productivity, and we talk about modernization of our, of our sector. It's not complicated. It really isn't complicated, but it is incredibly challenging because we are dealing with a lot of legacy systems, we're dealing with a lot of um, uh, cultural behavioural things, we're talking about a lot of, you know, as Mark mentioned earlier on, uh, supply chain challenges. There's all these big, uh, cumbersome legacy things that we have to deal with. It does make it quite a challenging uh, undertaking. We have to come at it from two different positions. We have to come at it from the top down, which is obviously what's happening with the government at the moment in terms of the transformation construction work that they're doing, but also the bottom up. And we've talked to quite a bit about skills. There was a lot of focus on skills about how we have to do that. There is an element of um, the establishment or you know, people funding skills and getting skills into the sector. There's also a very strong element of independence of thinking and people looking to see what skills they need, coming to events like this and starting that skills, uh, skills uh, route. Because one of the challenges is, of course, that you know, there needs to be feedback in both ways. Government will uh, respond to what industry is asking for and if industry isn't asking for more skills in certain areas, it will not be provided. So if digital is the answer, then what's the problem? We've talked about productivity and carbon, uh, carbon emissions from buildings and all this kind of stuff. I'm going to make a very, very generalistic, quick trot through why we have a challenge in our construction sector. Um, in uh, my previous work, I was uh, innovation lead for Innovation UK, and I ran quite a large program called the Building Performance Evaluation Program, where we spent um, four years looking at the performance in buildings. And this is a distillation of that information, put in a bit of a light-hearted way. So we have a systematic failure in construction. So if you think about the way that construction works in the round, first what the client asks for. The client has a very clear view in, it, in, its, in its mind about what they actually want as a, as a final product. They engage an architect. The architect has a lot of you know, uh, creative desire. So the creative desire comes out is a, a slightly different, perhaps a little bit more complicated um, interpretation of what the client wants. And then the designer interprets it. So this is when you start getting into value engineering and cost reductions. So the, the designer will interpret it in a slightly different way in order to make it probably more uh, deliverable and quicker and cheaper to develop. How the contractor built it, this is where you get to really fragmented into the supply chains. The contractor will be interpreting different uh, drawings in different ways, not communicating between themselves, and you'll actually get a product which is, uh, has all the right pieces but not necessarily in the right order. 
Then you come to the engineering, how the uh, commissioned it, commissioning and handover is always curtailed. It's always uh, money's been taken out of it through the general construction process. Uh, regular commissioning, seasonal commissioning is always a challenge, and so in that way, the systems that are in there don't always work terribly well together. And you, when you have uh, more energy uh, efficient or more technical, technologically advanced buildings, those systems have to work quite closely together, especially when you have different like, low-level computing heat systems. They need to work together, and that's not always the case. The key thing is how the building was documented. After you go through all this process, and everyone has their own manuals, and some of them are like, you know, so thick that they're just put in a cupboard somewhere, or well, some of them don't exist at all. You have your initial plans, and they're not updated, so you don't actually know what is in the building. You then hand it over to the client. This is a couple of years down the line now, so they have a completely different vision of what they asked for, something, you know, a bit more, you know, a bit more fancy than their original um, expectation for a far lower price. And then how it finally performed. You've got all these problems that amount to the end. And then when you have a building in use, which could be used in a very different way than it was actually designed to be used in the first place, because you've got um, uh, more people in it, or you've decided to put more rooms in it, or it's a, a completely different functionality. It was going to be uh, uh, you know, an open plan office, and then you turned it into you know, maybe multiple office, office sets. It doesn't work as you're intending to. That is a very generic, a bit of a tongue-in-cheek uh, rationalization about building performance, but it is essentially true. Those are essentially the challenges that we have. And the biggest challenge is communication. Communication through a very fragmented supply chain where that supply chain doesn't necessarily have the right mechanisms or the right trust to be able to communicate properly. So are we looking at an evolution or a revolution here? Um, Henry Ford famously didn't say, he actually, there's no evidence that he said this at all, I've looked it up. Um, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. And that's basically saying that we're in a stage at the moment where we know where we want to go and what we want to do, but we don't necessarily, we're using all these legacy systems, we're using all these uh, technologies, all these processes which have been, have been gone before. And Mark touched on it earlier on, in saying we start this golden thread of information, so we start with this horrific, thing called BIM, and then it gradually dissipates off into an analog system where you've got people on site with paper and not keeping it up to date. Um, I work with BIM a lot. I have a bit of a challenge with BIM because BIM is wrong. Not what it's trying to achieve, but what it's actually called. There's no B or M in the process of BIM. It's literally just I. It's just information. BIM is not Revit, BIM is not a program, BIM is a process that you follow and it's a structure that the way you structure information so people understand what they're doing at any particular time, time frame in a, uh, in a construction process. And the reason they do that is for the pieces I said earlier on about transparency, speed, quality and repeat, um, repeatability. So transparency, in essence, means better communication, access to knowledge, and access to understanding. That's really what we're meaning there, is allowing all levels of the supply chain to have the transparency of that information. So they know who is doing what. They have uh, a changing attitude that the client is not MS or British Land or Ministry of Justice. The client is the their client is the next person who's going to touch that part of the asset, that part of the process, after they have moved on. So it could be just the next person to touch the HVAC system. It could be the next person to touch the MVHR system. That is that person's client. It's the transparency of information. We've got lots of technologies that are coming in from that. We've got, you know, XR, who's love a new term. So XR is extended reality. That is, incorporates the virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality subjects. I'm not going to dwell on XR, but it's a very good way of showing quite complex information to people who maybe don't have as good technical skills as we're used to historically within the industry, who maybe don't have English as their first language in the industry, that's a really important place, visualizing from an individual's perspective what they need to do on site. Internet of Things is very prevalent at the moment. Manchester is, uh, is leading on a very strong um, City Verve project, which is looking at Internet of Things, about how uh, information is transferred and accessible on a wide area basis uh, within large sites. 
Uh, blockchain, I'm not going to go into any detail on blockchain. Uh, it is one of these odd technologies where it's, there's so much hype around blockchain at the moment. I personally, I do a lot of work in blockchain. Um, I think it has a very, very strong use cases, but they are overblown at the moment. The industry, or not our industry, but the general techno uh, technology audience for uh, any kind of solution to say, oh, blockchain will sort that out, that seems to be the go-to answer. It's, that's not the case. It's very specific applications. I'm actually doing some research at the moment on uh, industry red readiness and capability of um, blockchain in the industry. Um, I would be really keen to talk to people from this room because I would struggle to get hold of some of the SMEs because that's really important. If you're interested in participating in that research, it would just be a half hour conversation by phone at a later date. Catch me after this because I'd be really, really keen to talk to people about understanding of blockchain. If you know nothing about it, you're just as important as those people who do. So the next one was quality. Um, this is, uh, a lot of this is about, you know, we, it was mentioned earlier on again by Mark. Uh, we, we throw up buildings a lot of time at homes, uh, which, is, which are very poorly performing. And so you have a defect period that uh, carries on for a long period of time. Um, Off-site is one way of addressing this. That's not homes coming off the production line. It's all about uh, quality of skills and training on-site, uh, technology to assure quality. Um, we talk a lot again uh, early on about uh, millennials and the uh, people coming into the industry, but it was raised, I think, for a couple of people, what about the people who are in the industry now? I think some of these technologies are really, really uh, useful and really, really important to enable people to carry on uh, in the industry and keep assuring that quality because the, the level of knowledge and the level of skill is really important in this area. One of the other things as we talk about as, as well um, is in terms of quality is uh, the, the, the non-off site. So that's the innovative on-site, such as additive manufacturing, commonly known as 3D printing. That's where you add different layers of different products on top of each other. Um, again, I think this is going to be uh, a very important um, technology. We're not going to be building houses out of it. But when you start looking at a retrofit scenario, you can start building bespoke <coughs> elements to start making your house more, or your building more thermally performant, um, better performing thermally, on site using um, very accurate uh, technology for printing bits and pieces where you can start. So it's no longer going around with mastic and no, no longer going around with all these pieces. You can then start printing bespoke elements. Uh, speed, so speed's not just in building, it's about design, it's about planning, it's about the speed of sale, and not just sale, importantly rent. One of the challenges with the housing crisis at the moment, where we say there's not enough housing in the, in the market, is because we're not building enough housing for rent. When you build for rent, you, it's the, a developer wants to get it into the market much quicker. And so you can actually start getting buildings into the, into the homes market much quicker if you build them for rent. Um, it's about procurement and contracting and insurance. Uh, procurement and contracting, I think, are the two areas which will be very influenced by the blockchain technology um, in order to start uh, automating some of these procurement, de-risking some of the contracts and adding transparency into this multi-tier uh, supply chain that we have within the industry. So the whole point about the blockchain technology is to allow all players to understand what is happening within, the, uh, within that structure. Artificial intelligence has been picked on or, or talked about uh, briefly today. Um, again, I think artificial intelligence is a really important and emerging field. There's various different ways that you look at it. You've probably, I'd be very surprised if there's nobody in this room who's interacted with artificial intelligence in the last probably four to six months. If you're online and you use one of those chatbots, you know, when you, you say contact us and you chat online, that's probably initially an AI program that's delivering that. It's not a real person called Linda or Stuart or whatever at the end. It's actually an AI system. You probably saw in the, uh, in the news, we may saw in the news the other day about, um, it was called uh, Project Debater, I think it was called, in San Francisco, which was an IBM AI that had a live debate with a human. Um, uh, and there were two debates they had. There was one on should space exploration be publicly funded and one on uh, 
telemedicines, which is can, should you look at um, reducing uh, or enabling diagnosis over a, a remote connection. So there's two debates, and the the real only difference between the two, the human and the AI, as voted by the audience, is the human was more believable because of the non-verbal communication. The lines of argument, if you listen to the lines of argument, were incredibly rational from the AI. No pre-programming, nothing like that, just fed a load of information and given a subject to debate. It's this kind of stuff that made the person more believable. The eyesight, the arms, the gesticulations. And then two years ago, there was um, a, an AI that won $1.7 million dollars uh, at a game of Texas Hold'em poker with 40 of 14, I think it was, of the world's best Texan Hold'em poker players in the world, and it won $1.7 million in a genuine game. Now, you may say, oh, well, that's fine, because you've, you know, you've got AI that plays chess and Go, and there was the one on Jeopardy, the TV show, and all that kind of stuff. The challenge with poker is it's an imperfect game. With chess, there's always an outcome. With Jeopardy, there's always an answer. With poker, you can lie. I have a group of cards, but I'm going to tell you I, I can tell you I have something different. I will bet on an in-truth. I'm going to bet high, but I have a really rubbish hand. And that's where the AI comes into its own, where you think, actually, it's, it's judging whether somebody is likely to be lying, and it's making an in-truth itself. Those leaps in AI are really, really important. I don't believe that we're going to be overtaken by robots and AI on site. Mm -hmm. I think what we're going to be doing is having something which is actually a concept from the 1970s called intelligence amplification, which is using AI to start doing the heavy lifting of a lot of the work that we do. So it's using artificial intelligence to uh, de-risk projects by looking at history um, of contracts and where defaults and defects are made. It's by getting uh, better cost analysis by, again, looking at where costs overrun and costs don't overrun. And it's some, you know, some stuff on site in terms of the automation on site where you have to have uh, in very high risk scenarios where you actually have to have a, um, a machine with an, an element of AI in there in order for it to sort of control what it's doing. Again, there was a, a, an example from Heathrow where, you know, those trucks that pull the planes out and put them onto, onto the runway, they've actually automated some of that so that you can make people's time more productive because there's a human in control of that robot when it's taking the plane out, when there are people on the plane and that's the risky side, and when the plane is off, that robot will drive itself back to the depot and the person can then go on to the next, the next one, so rather than having to drive the truck back. It's that kind of stuff that we're going to be seeing. And again, repeatability is just is a, a key one. We've, I won't go on this too much because we've uh, already described it. It's not, we don't always have to build bespoke. Buildings aren't always prototypes. When you start collecting the information and you have that information to hand and you can reuse that information through whatever model you're using, whether it's a VR model, whether it's a BIM model, you can then start tweaking it and growing it and changing it on the basis of each application that you use. It's the same process that happens in car manufacturing all the time. They have a basic model, even across suppliers like SEAT and uh, Volkswagen, and there's another one as well, they're all, they're all basically the same car, which you put other bits on top of. It's that kind of mentality that we need to start adopting. So on that basis, do you have a digital mindset? Bill Gates once said that you always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next ten. The dates are really irrelevant. The point is that we shouldn't allow ourselves to be uh, lulled into a sense of inaction. There's things that people can do now, just because we're talking about maybe, you know, large um, off-site manufacturing facilities does not mean that you can't get involved in the kind of digital transformation that happens in an everyday world. So the future skill set is diverse. I think the key one is communication, uh, an level of creativity, curiosity. Data analysis is really important. We talk about the world of big data, but it's a case if you've put rubbish in, you need to, you will get rubbish out. As an industry, we're very, very bad at collecting information and learning from it and adapting to it. So we're, sta we're starting from a problem at the moment of the information that we have is not terribly good quality. You can stick that into an AI algorithm, into an artificial intelligence system, but if the data is rubbish, then you're still going to get rubbish out. 
Uh, so that is a, a key thing. When, as you, when you start going into uh, digitization of information, you know, digital security is a huge thing. And then leadership as well. Uh, you need people with the, the schutzpa to start pushing these things forward. The very pr fact that you will turn up to an event like this or you will be engaged in these conversations, this is the leadership that we're needing. It doesn't come from the top. It needs to come from the bottom as well. And a lot of it is a good dose of common sense. I mean, we're not, it's not like we're, we've just invented the wheel and now we're trying to fly to the moon. It's like, you know, we've, we adapt with changing technology all the time. And it's, you know, people wouldn't have had an Alexa in their home or had that voice interactions, you know, two years ago. And now we seem to be thinking, thinking it's fine. People are accepting this all the time. It's really not a problem. So finally, what can you do? What can you do now or what you, what you can do when you, when you finish it at this event? Firstly, this event is really important for getting the exposure to this kind of stuff and finding people, other people to talk to in networks. But keep a watching brief of what's happening and get ready when required. AI, you're not going to go into a shop and buy a box of AI. It's going to happen. It's going to be progressive, but you need to understand how it's going to impact you. Ask yourself, what problem are you actually looking to solve? Are you looking to solve a procurement problem, uh, a contracting problem, because you find it difficult to win work? Do you need to make it uh, an easier process for you to have a, a, a pattern of um, getting tenders out? Um, humans will be around for a while. We're not going to have Johnny Five the robot or anything like that. Um, make sure you have the right people first and then match the tool to that need. Don't just think, oh, this is the challenge with blockchain. Everyone's going, like, oh, blockchain's brilliant. What are you going to be using for it? I don't know. It's the, it's, that's looking at it the wrong, wrong way around. Um, times are a changing, so embrace and manage that change as much as possible. It is sometimes disconcerting when things change quite rapidly. Um, but you can, there's, there's always opportunities in these situations, and you need to embrace that and manage it as well as you can. And ask for help and buy in if necessary. I know I'm a, contra I'm a consultant, so I'm bound to say that, but you, know, there's, you don't always need, you don't need specialist help all the time. You need specialist help at particular, uh, particular times in a transformational curve. There are people here that will give you specialist help. There are other people outside of these groups that will give you specialist house help. Um, use it. And the last thing is, it's really a, a mindset. So it's analog people, I'm not gonna change to digital people, embracing change and really making that happen. And there are two different so mindsets, and this is not a millennials versus, you know, middle age to coming up to, you know, post 60, 70. Everybody is involved in this, and increasingly, everyone can be involved in this. Thank you, thank you for listening. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Matt. Um, enlightening. Um, now, we're up against the clock a little bit, so I'm going to move on uh, and introduce our next speaker, Matthew Egan, who's going to talk about off-site construction. Uh, Matthew is the founder and director of Modularize Limited. I'm going to ask why it's spelled with a Z and not an S. First question. Um, uh, it's an off-site construction enabler, providing design and manufacturing consultancy alongside full project management for modern method of construction projects. Okay, thank thanks, David. Um, so... I'm here today ready to present um, Offsite for SMEs, which I've kind of boxed together as a, a toolkit for SMEs entering offsite construction. So a bit of a background to modularize to start with. Uh, it was spelt with a Z, first of all, just to distinguish it. <laughs> so I thought it looked a bit um, pathetic with an S. So Fair enough. Just it up a bit. Um, so established in 2011, um, we essentially design products and that's anything it's not just modular despite the name it's anything from bathroom pods to fully finished modular solutions we've set up manufacturing facilities all around the globe so that's again bathroom pod panel manufacturing facilities modular facilities and recently we've just added another service which is off-site management so that is an encompassing end-to-end -end solution for off-site pro projects um, finding the best optimal solution to be um, tailored into your off-site project um, we encompass all of that. We're quite hot on digital engineering, so we are actually um, registered developers for the Microsoft HoloLens, so we've developed a few AR apps. We're also um, Apple app developers. We use BIM, um, and we integrate that all the way through the manufacturing cycle into the back end even of the, of the machines that, that run a factory. So 
on the agenda, I'd just like to set out what, what I'm going to talk about, basically. So we're going to be talking about how SMEs can benefit from off-site construction, what the barriers of entry to that might be for SMEs, uh, what is the best approach, and is there anybody out there actually doing it right? By default, when we think about off-site construction, we generally think of huge setup costs or so automating a uh, production line, robots even, um, empl employing hundreds of staff, training those staff and retaining those staff. But this isn't necessarily true for off-site construction. Equally, I often think that we, we talk about DFMA and DF did design for manufacturing design for assembly too much when there's actually more to think about. We hold quite close to our hearts at modularize the design principle called DFX. And the best way to explain this really is with an example. So this is a project called the Boulder, which was, um, was really a great example of ingenuity from a company called Mammoth van Sermen Group in Holland. They were actually famous for raising the Kersk submarine, which is a Russian submarine. It was sunk for a while, and I think it was it was a while, for a while thought impossible to raise that submarine, but they, they managed it in 2001. The year after, they built this massive um, boulder-shaped boulder uh, offices, their headquarters, built it off-site in a factory. It was designed to be transported on these special um, transport uh, stillages that they designed specifically for this project. It was floated down the river, and it was also designed to be maneuvered into place and transported under this bridge at low tide. So that actually set the height. It overcome a number of constraints and it was a successful off-site construction project in that it was eight weeks shorter to build than the anticipated traditional build program. So this is what I mean when I talk about DFX. And what else do we need to consider for off-site construction? Well, transport might be another thing that we'd want to add on there. So we don't want to transport modules that are 5.7 meters wide and incur a lot of transport constraints. Um, we want to design for weight, so we minimize the cost of the crane on site, for example. And similar to the boulder, are there any telecoms or power cables that we need to avoid during transport and installation? What else are we going to be designing for when we think about off-site for SMEs. Well, I've used re residential sector as a, as a topic since this uh, is something that we've been focused on for the last three years. So the purpose of this slide really is to just demonstrate that there's a large proportion of residential schemes that are actually one to ten units. So this this kind of ties in with the, when you when you think about the, the, the variation of of what those developments look like in the UK, we've got different aesthetics um, different local requirements in terms of planning, different regulations and guidance. And compared to automotive, we don't have any kind of fixed regulations in that, you know, the boot size of a, of a vehicle doesn't change because somebody's issued a new regulation on space requirements, for example. So to totally understand what we must achieve um, for SMEs, we need to take a look at the UK supply chain in offsite and its capability. We need to think about production dynamics in terms of push and pull and how that, how that, is, how that extend, extends into the supply chain. We need to think about manufacturing economies and economies of scale. The optimal use of pre-assembly uh, pre and construction. So again, it's not just modular, there's loads of different types of offsite that you can blend into your project. So first of all, looking at push and pull. It's an important manufacturing concept. And push is basically when a bill of materials is defined up front and the product is then delivered to the customers and shipped out as a finished unit. A good example of this is probably when you think about things like light bulbs and microchips, um, door handles, that kind of stuff. Pull is when a bill of materials is defined through a set process of re design requirements. So going to draw on from the initial design concept and design brief and then work backwards through a set of um, engineering routines to develop the bill of materials. So a really good example that I often refer to is, is, is Dell in terms of push and pull. So Dell 
actually assemble they assemble 70 percent of their product to a fixed bond a fixed bill of materials and then they that those components are essentially pushed to them from their supply chain the rest of the product is assembled with 30 percent of a variable bond so these are things that you can add a different hard drive you can add a different ram all that kind of stuff and it gives the perception at the end of the day of the customer having more choice so we, we call it more choice less choices in that it's a perceived choice to the customer that's driven through a manufacturing process it gives this build to order perception essentially so dell in order to do this they must have a really well established supply chain right and in computers that's probably a lot more advanced than it is in at this stage of off-site construction in the uk but what is it actually like for off-site construction in the uk in terms of a supply chain at the moment so it's my belief, and, and you know we've been around the world looking at different supply chains and different offsite solutions, and the UK is without doubt uh, the f most advanced and diverse in terms of pre-assembled products that are being offered onto the market. So familiar item there is pods, so that's bathroom pods, kitchen pods, number of suppliers all, all around the world, and, and particularly in Europe, where bathroom pods now offering competitive prices. Um, Pucks, they're pre-installed or pre-engineered utility cupboards. We've got a client who manufactures Pucks, um, and he started manufacturing them two years ago, and he's now got a 40 million pound backlog of orders. So it's a really kind of emerging market that's being used in offsite and traditional construction indeed as well. Plug and play electrics has come on a long way as well. And every day, literally, I must, well, every week, I must be hearing about a new light gauge steel manufacturer who's popped up. So we have a wide variety of different levels of pre-assembly kind of at our fingertips ready to use. Now, what do I mean when I talk about pre-assembly? I basically mean the upfront engineering of a product to achieve the goal of streamlining a process. Now this is an example, it's a video. Um, I'll, I'll start playing it in a second, I'll just give you a bit of background, because I'm sure you've seen it all before. Uh, I think it was on television about a couple of nights ago actually on Channel 5. This is a company called BSB, which is a Chinese company who built actually the tallest prefabric, well, tallest prefabricate building for a while until um, Atlantic Yards in New York was built. Oh, didn't seem to work. Just double click on it. Okay, you got it. Gonna talk over it, but this too loud. <laughs> okay, so this next bit is basically. I mean, when I first saw this, I thought this was in days, but it's actually hours in time lapse.
Oh, we started again. So at 360 hours, the building's basically built. It's um, obviously used a lot of design for, you know, planning up front, a lot of pre-assembled components. Um, so coming back now to the UK and looking at the supply chain for pre-assembly specifically to enable SMEs to use off-site in off-site construction. Um, like I said, there's, there's, there's new LGS suppliers popping onto the market every day. So we've got EOS, uh, Icarus, and do these tend to be based in the northeast of the UK? Um, in terms of the, the PUCs, the pre-installed utility cupboards, there's two of our clients there that are already manufacturing these things, and there's, there's, there's loads of them popping into existence as well, and really successfully delivering products into traditional construction as well. Bathroom and kitchen pods, like we're saying, there's, there's loads of these suppliers all the way around the UK, and, and particularly in Europe, in, um, in the western side of Germany, um, sorry, eastern side of Germany, you can get a lot of these guys producing really quality pods at low cost. So the other thing we need to talk about is economies of scope and scale. And it's important to do this so we can establish what level of pre-assembly is best suited to your off-site construction project. Again, um, some examples of economies and sco of, of, of scope first. So if we look at the aerospace industry, you can think of Airbus and Boeing and how they assemble the nose. Well, basically the nose, the wings, and the, and the tail are all pre-assembled standard components. And then the fuselage version you know, differs for different types of aircraft. In the automotive sector, somebody we touched on this earlier as well, um, Ford Focus, Mazda 3, and Volvo S40 all share commonality in the platform. So reusability of components and a, a simplified starting point from the design process. Now, I'm showing my age a little bit on this one, but the Sony Walkman had over 160 variations that were leveraged basically by mixing and matching different modular components. Economies of scale, it's a little bit easier to explain, basically all about bulk purchases, all about uh, the, the buying power and, and the kind of volume that you've got to reduce your, your unit, unit cost. And banks, similar example, generally lower interest rates to bigger businesses than smaller businesses. And then the resource one as well on economies of scale is basically, you know, like when you're a small company, your, your managers are kind of doing all different things and multitasking. And as that company grows, your managerial staff tend to focus and hone in on one skill set and then become more efficient. So going back to my first point about misconceptions in offsite, and this is, I mean, Modularize was really set up to address the barriers of entry in offsite construction. And there was two things, address the barriers of entry in offsite to offsite construction and bridge the gap from, there's a massive chasm between architectural design intent and manufacturing design. So one of the probable preconceptions or misconceptions that I like to address is, is a high cap capex is, is generally thought of as a requirement to start in offsite construction. There's also a really small, a really small pool of, of designers and, and manufacturing consultants out there that have actually got some experience of doing things right. And the biggest barrier of entry or, or constraint that you need to, to think about first is, is pipeline. So um, planning constraints and land are two big issues that come into play. And we've heard about digital engineering. And BIM is obviously becoming more commonplace, but it makes a real perfect bedfellow for off-site pre-assembled manufactured construction in that a lot of that design has to be up, done up front. A lot of that thinking's already done. So it, it lends itself quite well to being manufactured. 5D, we've seen 5D, 6D, 7D. Like, like the X, you can add as many Ds as you want, I suppose. So you can go cost. Um, we integrate um, cost into the manufacturing model as well as time into the BIM model. And like I was talking about VR and AR, there really is a low cost of entry to using these um, pieces of hardware now. We're seeing them being actually used in, 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 in anger in, in, a, in a lot of places now as well. So quite simply, we can't deliver the best solution until we've basically gone around this circle and addressed a lot of these issues. We need to understand the level, right level of pre-assembly and we need to design a solution that basically meets all the constraints or thinks about things thoroughly through all the constraints in the context of all of these different issues. And there are companies out there that are doing it right. Very proud to have Oscar as one of our clients they stand out because they are one of the new market entry entrants who've successfully 
emerged and being used in off-site construction, in this case it's, it's panelised construction. Thinking back to the BSB video, when I play this time lapse I think we can all take some solace that the UK market is moving in the right direction and there are definitely viable solutions for SMEs in off-site. No cool music on this one. So these are light gate steel panel edge system fully finished on the outside with the windows and the doors all pre-installed. Uh, three days completely done you've just got to basically zip up the joints it's a watertight fully finished building so to summarize i'd like to leave you with some tips for smes entering the off-site sector so get the design right this is um where bim and digital engineering can really help out eliminate errors in the engineering process up front integrate existing supply chain components so that means collaborate and we've heard a lot about that today as well apply economies of scope and you know utilize that existence and emergent supply chain and all the digital capability that they've got within the organizations assemble don't manufacture because this keeps capex low and indeed keeps you flexible in terms of operating costs because you don't need to set up lots of you know investment in the in the plant and the kit to get your factory going Factory control process is vital. So again, Mark, Mark touched on this earlier in that, you know, offsite construction is not necessarily a big factory. It, 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 it's, it's a process of manufacturing. And uh, once you adhere to that process in a controlled way, you, you generally tend to reap the benefits from offsite construction. So share commonality and standardize, offer more choice, less choices. And this is coming back around to the push and pull dynamic. So that kind of gives the customer the end well, the end user or the customer, the perception of more choice and less choices again. So finally, you know, we've been around for a while now, like eight, seven or eight years, modularized. Uh, we've seen offsite construction all the way around the globe. I'd like, like you to just take this thought away from you. We actually know that a manufacturing facility that can output 250 units, so that's 250 houses or 250 apartments a year, can be set up for a capex cost of 250K. Okay, that's me. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can't see Matt. Matt, do you want to come and join us on the stage? And uh, we've got precisely eight minutes for questions because uh, we're going to get uh, <coughs> get you out for your lunch at 22. Um, so really fascinating. And I think a key theme you both stressed was how these two uh, seemingly different things, digital construction or site construction, are actually part of the same thing, aren't they? Um, so, uh, who would like to ask the first question? Last your thing. Okay. Yep. Yeah, Dave. Uh, Dave Jeff, uh, principally tied to the fact you, you read, mentioned in your presentation the eye of BIM is the most important element of it to an extent. Is there a, a very real risk? And are we seeing actually the, the construction industry uh, as a wider sector focusing on things like Revit? Um, uh, yes, absolutely. But I think that that uh, issue has been recognised. Um, hence, the the move away from BIM being used as a, as an acronym and a, and a phrase. I mean, the whole concept behind the Centre for Digital Built Britain and that whole Digital Britain thing is to move away from the BIM concept. And you even have, uh, you know, the uh, organisations such as the you know the UK BIM Alliance looking at how they're rebranding and how they're repositioning themselves. Um, the, the, the challenge that I see with BIM is that it was, it's, 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 it's great, it serves a purpose, it has a very, very narrow audience for BIM as in its entirety from the beginning to end, but what has happened is there's been no agency or no, audit or no allowability for people who operate in the construction life cycle to be able to dip into BIM and pull out the bits they need at any one point, and I think that's where we're going at the moment. So we'll start seeing more emphasis on the information and how the smaller players throughout the construction life cycle can pull that info bit out without getting bogged down about 
you know, British standards on BIM and ISO and, you know, PAS, whatever it is. It's, it's irrelevant. Can I follow up with a quick supplementary? Yeah. Is the, you mentioned the claim that the construction industry uh, to understand BIM, is that the limiting factor as well? Are our clients asking that they're engaging with proper, what the better phrase, proper BIM uh, as they should be? Or the fact that buildings are handed over because the client is fully aware or fully informed? Well, I think there are, two, there are two sides to that. There's those who have engaged, and I think they're trying their best to engage and make uh, and really make uh, inroads into the, the BIM management and BIM as a process. Um, I know uh, private sector organisations that just go like, "I'm not doing BIM because it's not mandatory, and I don't do any government projects, so why should I bother?" So there, there's two complete flip sides of that. Is that the, it's it's very actually, it's really very very difficult to become entirely BIM compliant. You know, as as an organisation, it's really a, it's a really challenging thing to do, and so some people just don't bother. <laughs> okay, uh, who here is using BIM? Again, more than Nottingham, but not <laughs> that many hands. So uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Next question. Okay, just whilst you're, you're clearly thinking about it, I, I have one. So um, I spoke to a lot of the delegates before today's event to find out what their needs were. We did surveys, phone calls, all sorts of things. Um, there was massive interest in off-site construction. Um, that didn't particularly surprise me because of the kind of drivers that there are in the market. What people did say to me was that there were reservations and doubts. Um, and you talked a bit about barriers to entry. Slightly different thing, but there are obstacles, barriers in the way of clients and contractors saying, yeah, this is the way, let's do it. Um, they say, we think that's the way, let's look at it. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the issues they were talking about to me were, they felt that the buildings looked the same, particularly homes, that they weren't what consumers, customers wanted, homeowners wanted, um, and they talked about expense. Now, whether that's true or not, I'll allow you to comment on, but how would you respond to those reservations? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, this kind of falls in line with the misconceptions that I was trying to touch on. So, you know, you can set up manufacturing facilities using various different levels of pre-assembly and off-site construction to address, you know, I mean, not, not all buildings are going to be square and boxy shaped, but you can get, you can get a lot of flexibility and you can get some really nice design buildings. Um, Again, the setup costs are probably propagated by a lot of the industry. Like, um, you know, if you look back to when manufacturing, manufacturing construction was was actually in its in its heyday not so long ago, with the likes of Unite and Chorus Living Solutions and the fully automated manufacturing facilities, churning out you know a module every eighty minutes. Um, now again, you've got um, LNG setting up, spending millions and millions. Um, essentially, you know we've seen and proven that this is, doesn't necessarily have to be the case which is one of the reasons I was talking about OSCO you know they don't spend lots and lots of money setting up fully automated manufacturing facilities which then inherently the more you automate the more you constrain so the more you constrain that end product essentially so um, I think I think it's basically kind of summarizing all the questions that you put together it's courses for courses and finding the right level of pre-assembly for that specific project you know if you look at the size of um typical residential developments in like small up to 50 maybe um or you know occasionally you get the, the bigger ones um and then so from development to development you've got different house types and different configurations of those house types so if you set up this manufacturing beast to kind of churn out these repeatable same sausages over and over again and then it comes to the next project, you've got to reconfigure it. And I think there's some of the things that scare people off where I'm trying to get to is, it doesn't necessarily have to be like that. Okay. Okay. So for you clients and contractors out there, are you reassured by what you've just heard? Some nods. Yeah. Okay. That's encouraging. Any final questions? Uh, yep. uh, Roger Burden, um, Chair from Certainly Action Manchester. I think there is a tendency for, for people to think about offsite think about sort of pre-planned manufactured modules and uh, seem to be locked into that idea which in, it, in itself is probably a good one because we can bring something that's totally pre-finished to site without all the issues of weather and that but I think I think Mark's uh, Mark Farmer's kind of coming from something which is about you know pre-manufacture 
So we're actually sort of adding value to components, mm -hmm. maybe trying to take more of what we bring onto site into a factory so it comes onto site further developed or ready to, to be assembled together with other components on site without being sort of patched up with you know, mortar and, and mastic. Mm -hmm. So have you got kind of any view on that? I mean, I think it's what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly, exactly what I'm saying. It's pre-assembly and yeah. supply chain. It's not all about trying to manufacture the, the total end yeah. product. It's, it's trying to add value to all the parts yeah. that come together. Exactly. Yeah. I think I mean, we shouldn't start with the immediate conception that modular is the right so solution when we speak about off-site construction because it is all about pre-assembly and achieving or, or ascertaining the right level of pre-assembly that is going to you know, turn a profit or make your project go faster or whatever your desired outcome is and my point when I was trying to make is that, that, that thankfully and I think Mark was kind of reflecting this as well the, the market in the UK is definitely improving in terms of the supply chain and the availability of different products to be used in all manner of different construction projects. Matt, any comment? Uh, yeah, I just think I, I do quite a lot of my work still with Innovate UK and I work through the Catapult network, the digital Catapult in particular and we've got quite a strong um, manufacturing stream there and what we're looking for is how you can start um, adding you know once you've got uh, an off-site process or a factory or supplier up and running and how you can actually leverage that to then bring SMEs in so if we can start identifying um, you know small plots of infill land and allowing those to be through a, a streamlined digital planning process to allow small builders to start building one or two units with a an off-site, you know, manufacturer, almost, I don't want to use the word cookie cutter, but I already have, um, process, then you can start really uh, utilizing some of that, the, the information, the digital knowledge behind that to start bringing in more value into the supply chain and get things produced and built much quicker. So you don't then have to rely on, you know, uh, units of, you know, 25 up with 50, 150 um, uh, development plots, which are sometimes quite difficult to come by you can really start pushing it out it's you know it's it's not an immediate thing we just have to get over some of the initial challenges at the moment but that's where we're trying to look at is really opening up those digital assets to the entire ACO sector rather than just you know maybe an, you know <coughs> legal and general and stuff yeah so just kind of following on from that if you take the example of the the pucks the pre-installed utility cupboards um, we're creating digital assets for configurable pucks so you've got standard pucks and you've got some pucks that you can configure some have got MVHR in some have got a um, washing machine and tumble dryer in for example so um, when you can configure your puck for your project you want a hundred of these particular pucks and 200 of those ones you can then press a button and it will generate the digital assets and all the information that is then sent to the manufacturer for production Fantastic. I'm going to have to cut short uh, the debate there, I'm afraid, because people are hungry. Uh, but thank you ever so much, uh, Matt and Matthew. Um, I'm sure you're sticking around for just a little bit over lunch, yeah, I hope. Yeah. So uh, any further questions, please pick them up over lunch. We're going to take 45 minutes now for lunch, so we're going to reconvene at uh, 25 past one. Um, just a reminder to those of you who've got a, a meetings passport, it'd be really good if you could say hello to the people that uh, have been listed in there in the exhibition. Those meetings are on their stand, so just go along to their stand. Uh, and also there's two clinic opportunities, one at uh, 12.50 and one at five past one. So find out what's of interest to you and just turn up at the stand uh, for those. Uh, so we'll be back after lunch. We're focusing on energy and retrofit, so please don't, uh, don't go away. Uh, enjoy your lunch. Thank you. Okay, welcome back to our final session. Um, this is all about how we're going to go about decarbonising Greater Manchester, which is the challenge that uh, Andy Burnham uh, and Councillor Genotis appear to have set. Uh, we're going to look at both new build and retrofit, and to do that we're joined by two uh, leading lights in the uh, world of sustainable design, construction and retrofit. Um, firstly, Roger Burton. Um, Roger's been in continuous practice since the mid-1970s, so his LinkedIn profile tells me. Now, it's 40 plus years, I think you said it was nearly 50 earlier. Uh, uh, and um, when I met uh, Roger recently, I was so impressed with his commitment to this agenda. Um, I know he's very passionate 
uh, about sharing the knowledge that he's built up over, over all those years. Um, he's also currently the uh, chair of the Constructing Excellence Group in Manchester. Uh, following on from Roger, we have Russell Smith, uh, who you've heard Retrofit Works mentioned a number of times this morning. Uh, we're going to hear all about that and how that, that's going to work in practice. Okay, so uh, Roger, if you'd like to kick us off. Thanks, David, okay. and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I just move on to that. Uh, that is indeed me. Yeah. Um, your your program um, sets a number of uh, questions here, uh, and the first one is: What does the vision for zero carbon city region mean to you? And I presume that means you, but it's probably also asking me what what I think as well. And the second one is: What are sustainable design, are, are sustainable design and good design the uh, the same thing? Well. My answer to that is yes, um, but perhaps I can just begin to put those things sort of in the context of what's happening in Manchester, uh, its buildings and its heritage. Um, the answer to the first one, what does it mean to me? Well, essentially, you know, the Green Summit set down what our challenge is. Uh, we're going to take uh, a decade out of the, the government's target for 2050 for reducing our CO2 levels. Uh, so we've got a shorter time scale, uh, there's some urgency about it. We've only got just over 20 years to get our act together and actually deliver. So we've got to start now. We can't, there's no time to waste. We've got to invest more in energy generation storage control. You've heard a lot about that today. More smart, renewable sources. Uh, and the current building stock. So we're going to look, just look at that and think about that and maybe you know, consider how that might be able to generate, generate new jobs. Uh, and all new homes to be net zero carbon and some we haven't actually got a target for that yet but it was promised to us uh, at the Green Summit so what is our challenge well I mean it's uh, in terms of the existing building stock um, there is a significant challenge because particularly of its age and its age range I don't know if you're familiar with Manchester, but you may be familiar with some of these buildings. And these, these date right back to the first decade of the, uh, of the 20th century. Um, so there's Asia, Asia House there on, on the left. You may know just opposite Piccadilly Station, just up at the approach, is the Joshua Hoyle Building, which is the third one there. It's now Malmaison. Right through to, and, and they're all of that sort of period, that first decade, right through to the one on the right is uh, Pearl Assurance building, Pearl, Pearl, Pearl House, which is 1955. So it's kind of like a halfway through that sort of 110 years that uh, we're looking at here. Um, and then we move on to that sort of second half of, the, uh, of, of this, this period. Uh, there's, there's sort of Pearl House again. But then we start to see a kind of quite dramatic difference in, in what's appearing in Manchester. It's CIS building there, uh, the building there, I'm not quite sure the name of it, I can't find one for it, it's just near the library. Uh, and very recently those last two um, are um, uh, embankment, which is just on the sort of border of near Victoria Station, and uh, the Shuster building annex on the university campus, which sits alongside of Brook Street. So there's a, there's a sort of period there, which is over a century uh, of the stock. Uh, and you know, we can see the scale of what we've kind of got to do and the range of different types of buildings that we've got to address. Some more recent, some very early, obviously all subject to different regulatory regimes. So I thought we'd sort of have a look at what other industries have been doing over that 110 years or so. Um, on the left there, the first Model T Ford, somebody mentioned, I think quoted um, or, or, or misquoted Henry Ford, but anybody remember when the first Model T Ford rolled off the uh, production line? You'll have been looking it up, you'll have been Googling it now since it was mentioned. But it was uh, 1908, uh, 1st of October 1908, so 110 years ago, and in that 110 years, we know that the, the uh, automobile industry has gone through dramatic changes and, you know, to now the production lines are largely sort of robotics, although you may hear I mentioned this morning how Toyota are thinking about introducing human beings back onto the production line again because I think there's some advantages. Right through on the right there, that's an autonomous zero emission vehicle. So that's the sort of pace that they've made. Agriculture, remarkable changes. 
again, you know, the early 1900s there, we were just about getting tractors, and it's hauling a plough, and there's still two people involved in that, right through to, and if you've been sort of listening to the radio or, 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 or reading recently, the, um, uh, the Hansbury hectare in Worcestershire, it's a whole hectare of farmland, which has been farmed by robotics. Nobody walks onto that field. It's all observed from, um, uh, from whatever they're called, and uh, you know they, they can they can check the check their um, uh, the growth of it. You know, almost identify weeds, treat it, uh, and then they can uh, they can maintain it and harvest it. It's using autonomous vehicles. So you know, quite a dramatic change over that period. So what about architecture? What's happened over that period in architecture? Well, the building there on the on the left there is um, is uh, Peter Behrens' uh, AEG works, which again was in that first decade. Remarkably, that building was contemporary with some of the earlier things like Asia House I was, I was just showing you. Um, the war intervened, but uh, by sort of 1920s, uh, 1919, the Bauhaus was formed. That was not a design school in Germany. It wasn't just architecture, it was the arts, it was theatre, it was dance, it was graphics, it was furniture. But a style emerged which was, you know, it, sort of mechanistic. There's a great interest in, um, in large areas of glazing, uh, the, this, this whole sort of uh, approach exemplified in some of these schemes here, the Bauhaus scheme, uh, Rietveld in Holland, the top right in housing, and Corb himself there in Paris in, in a couple of schemes there, Pavilion Suisse and uh, City Refuge. They were around 1930, 1933. So there's a fascination with technology, and uh, it was described as the architecture of the machine age. And when I came into architecture, which say goes back a little bit, it was late 60s, early 70s, uh, Bannum's theory of design in the first machine age here was almost like a, an essential reading. And his further classic text, text here, which came out in 1969, uh, was the architecture of the well-tempered environment. And that was talking about really how architecture is influenced by energy technologies, by the lighting, by the heating, and how this is adapted and integrated into the building, either successfully or in some cases not particularly successfully. And in the book he describes some of the early buildings which really were exploring how the architect can work alongside the engineering. And architects really understood how buildings worked and could engineer buildings, understood about heating and ventilation and how they could integrate it into, in, into their building. And this is what Bannon was exploring. And here we see on the left, uh, you probably all recognize that now, that's Charles Rennie Mackintosh's Glasgow School of Art, sadly um, affected by a fire in the last uh, few days. He said uh, of that, that it displayed an ingenuity and invention, because he looked at the way it was heated, the way it was ventilated, and that was all integrated and embraced by the building and its structure. The one to the immediate right there is the Larkin building in Buffalo, both these 1904-1906. This is Frank Lloyd Wright. And again, this, this was a building alongside a noisy, uh, polluted environment, a railway, and it was totally sealed building, and it was mechanically ventilated uh, and probably cooled. Um, and uh, again, sadly, that was demolished in about 1950. Now, engineering does influence the way we design our buildings, the sort of engineering we can put into our buildings. Lighting was seen very rapid development. Even by the end of the 18th century, end of the, end of the 19th century, I should say, uh, Edison was experimenting with fluorescence. And, um, Finally, it would be about 1938 when Westinghouse and GEC both introduced fluorescent lighting. And at the same time, at the beginning of the same century, over that same period, from 110, a series of patents were put in place by Kramer and Carrier. Carrier is still a name that we know on, the, on air conditioning systems. And they set out the principles of what one of them called air conditioning. It's when the term first arose. And in terms of Carrier, he talked about man-made weather. And a whole series of patents were um, were uh, uh, were placed at that time around around air conditioning. Uh, Banham actually describes those as a kit of new mechanical devices, which he says facilitated changes, which meant that 
not having to adapt the structure to husband or create particular environment qualities was possible. So in a way, the, the architect is suddenly given great freedom because he doesn't have to worry about engineering systems. It's all there, he's got this kit apart, somebody will make it work. And, um, and the result basically was, with air conditioning and the fluorescence, which were giving out a lower heat output, of course, than a tungsten light, you could achieve a balance which allowed you to build deep plan buildings and highly glazed buildings. So you were less concerned about solar gain, uh, and uh, you had less heat from the lighting, and didn't really matter being deep because you had a ventilation system and air conditioning system. The result was these next few buildings here. The first of its type really was, again, Corbusier, that's the UN building in New York. Now, amazingly, these two huge grey glazed facades here face roughly east-west. And we'd normally expect they'd be subject to considerable overheating, which indeed they probably were, except it was absolutely full of air conditioning, huge air conditioning load, but it didn't matter because energy was cheap, and this was, you know, the new mechanistic architecture. This is what everybody had been striving for, these large glazed uh, facades on these simple buildings with deep plan. And again then in 1951, the Lever building, by SOMN. So very early 50s, all that came together to produce a whole series of buildings like this, the high rise, the deep plan, the highly glazed, the air conditioned. Now that, that sort of uh, model has persisted for the next 50 or more years. It's still with us now. In 1961, Manchester got its um, uh, CIS building, at that time the tallest building in the UK. Uh, it was shortly, um, I think within months, the Millbank Tower exceeded it. So, moving just on a few years, 1972, I was still at university. Um, architects began to realise that um, you know, we couldn't really go on like this. We had to really begin to think about um, how we designed our buildings that we couldn't continue to depend upon what is described here as man-made energy. And, um, and Alex Gordon, who was the chair at the time of all this long life, loose fit, low energy initiative. And uh, so he said, you know, we shouldn't be good environment, uh, environmental, environmentalists, except in our own backyard. We've got to get out there and we've got to spread the message that we've got to do something about this and reduce our, reduce our energy consumption. Um, and he went on to say, you know, we'll undertake a study. Over the last 20 years, we've depended on man-made man -made energy. That takes us right back to those early 50s, when I was showing you those first two buildings, the UN and the, uh, and the Lever building. And uh, we should be moving towards something that where building itself, you know, is used to stabilise, to provide good environmental conditions. It was another really, you know, almost 20 years into the 80s before we started to think about uh, global warming and climate change, which is obviously one of the reasons we're all here today. And again, I don't think we need to say any more about that. Um, at that time, uh, in fact, out of that initiative was what's called the Four Professions Energy Groups, uh, which comprised the RIBA, SIBC, uh, CIOB and the RICS, who came together, understanding that if we're going to make uh, we're going to improve the performance of our buildings. It's got to be a collaborative effort. And um, the Four Professions Energy Group, it was Energy Group Northwest here, published this guide, a client's energy and environment briefing guide, where we set out really some of the um, issues so our client could understand it. Because first and foremost, you recognise that architects on their own can't do anything. We need clients who are understanding you know, where, we, where we need to be heading, understand the issues and be able to brief their team with that sort of level of understanding. So really, all things changed. Um, we started talking about carbon. It wasn't just about energy more. Um, and we began to realise that you know, we really had to do something about it. We had to start reimagining our buildings, looking, taking a step back and, and thinking about how they perform without necessarily relying on uh, the sort of ubiquitous uh, air conditioning systems, particularly in, uh, in commercial buildings. 
So what are our challenges? Well, we are still left with this. You know, here, here again, this building, I think it's probably about the 70s. I don't remember that actually going up, that particular building on the left there. But obviously, there are, Manchester's got this whole range of buildings with a whole series of diff different, uh, different challenges from the more modern schemes, which are you know, highly glazed, uh, right back to uh, that one on Portland Street, some of these earlier buildings, which obviously are... Uh, of smaller window areas, thicker walls, more thermal mass, um, but probably not probably not significant amount of uh, insulation in them. Um, but the challenges are really, you know, the same for all our buildings. There on the right, that's a very, you know, I say contemporary. That's been completed in the last year or so. So if we look at older buildings, I think, I think we've got to recognise there's really some value in those buildings. Um, we want to be able to keep those buildings. They offer a lot in terms of sort of quality of our built environment. Some of them are listed. Um, so what, what, what can we do about those? We've really got to also recognise that there is, you know, we're talking now about whole life carbon. That's sort of coming through every, everything we've been talking about today. It isn't just about their in use. It's about the construction process. It's, that, it's everything that building uh, will consume over its, over its lifetime, including its maintenance, its replacement of components, and, the, and its energy use, which generates carbon. And you know, as, as we reduce the, increase the performance, improve the performance of our building, the element of that uh, whole life, which is actually in the building itself, in its construction, its materials, is significantly increased. And there's a lot more work being done on that now, yeah. and and a belief that you know we've got to take that whole life approach. So you know what are we what are we going to do with these buildings? It's the same, you know, we've got to be thinking about exactly the same things that we would normally expect to talk about: improving the performance of things like glazing, potentially internal insulation. Everything that we're talking about in connect, you know, just the same in connection with our domestic stock, uh, getting the energy of our lighting down, thinking about air infiltration. Um, but there's always going to be a heating requirement for these buildings. We've got to think about how we can supplement our energy into those buildings using renewables. There are heat networks and energy networks being uh, considered and developed. Some are already in place around Manchester. How can we tap into that? How can we share energy? Uh, and maybe, you know, how can, we, how can we use the roof spaces and the like to, uh, to introduce uh, renewable energy? On these sort of, these earlier, rather more contemporary buildings, just drawn a connection there with one of the uh, Corbusier schemes I, I showed you earlier there. That was the um, uh, City de Refuge, which is in Paris. Um, and it was interesting because at that time, that was in the 30s, if you remember, uh, we were looking at, looking at some of those buildings. Um, Corb was thinking about um, how you know, we could manage the internal environment. This is what um, Ban was talking about in the well-tempered environment. And, and, and he, had a, he had a concept of what he called mur neutralisement, which meant that the wall itself would kind of neutralise the space it, you know, from the external to the inside. And it was essentially a two, two glazed walls with a cavity and conditioned air would be passed into that cavity. Um, St. Gorban, I think, were doing work on that, and they said it's not going to work, Corb. And, um, but that was a concept he was thinking would develop. And that was coupled with respiration exact, which was a ventilation system which was constantly kept at 18 degrees C. So in combination of those, he thought he'd sort of crack the large glazed external wall and the orientation issues and the like. Um, in the end, that building... Uh, didn't adopt that, it was single glazed, it had significant overheating problems and in 1955 the right hand picture there shows the same building with Brie Salai retrofitted onto it. Um, so I think in terms of our existing building stock we've got to think about you know have we got any issues with overheating, how can we address solar gains, how can we improve the performance of the facade, think about low energy lighting, we want to, as far as possible, uncouple some of these buildings from air conditioning systems, uh, reconsider ventilation systems, say reduce or eliminate air conditioning. What we really do need from our existing stock is a lot of data, because you know we cannot really think about 
how we're going to redesign some of these, re-engineer these buildings if we don't understand how they're performing. So that, that is a big challenge for us. And I think we talked earlier about you know gathering data, having all that evidence so that on, on the back of that. And we need to think about these things holistically as well. How can we plug some of these buildings into citywide systems and you know uh, give and take on the energy, contribute to to heat networks or take energy out of heat networks. So we've got to have a holistic approach to it. But within that, I think there are some things that, uh, some opportunities that might arise in terms of looking at our existing stock and deciding how they will be re-engineered. On the new bill front, uh, and I illustrate here, um, actually three schemes there. They look quite, um, looks like four, but actual fact, I don't know how many people are familiar with these. Uh, one is the embankment building I've talked about before, which was which is down on the uh, down near Victoria Station, uh, the Schuster annex there, and uh, and the third one there. It's only one building. Is the Bright building? Um, now all the, all these these three schemes were nominated for our IBA awards, um, and I know a little bit about them and their performance or the projected performance. Um, embankment there. Um, probably uses about twice as much energy as the bright building there on the right and in turn that uses twice as much as the Schuster building. In fact the bright building on the right uh, has a heating demand which is matched by the embankment but that it, it, it has an equal cooling demand as well. Uh, so that makes the difference between those, those particularly two and doubles the amount of energy it's used. Um, the bright building is actually designed to be a naturally ventilated building. And you know, the one thing that strikes me is, you know, the facades. There's two different facades there. It seems to recognise that actually the sun does move around the sky, and east, west, and south have different issues, different problems. Uh, and so it, it's responded to that. Equally, the Shuster Annex there, it's a very difficult site. It's right on the edge of Upper Brook Street. It's noisy, it's dirty, it's polluted. So that's a totally sealed building. It's mechanically ventilated. But nevertheless, it's achieving very, very good. Uh, performance and low energy demand. Um, the interesting thing about the uh, the uh, Bright Building, which is on the Science Campus in Manchester, is that they've also installed battery packs. There's potential to add PV, PVs on the roof. And I was talking to them recently. It's gas fired, but I said, you know, you get you get your batteries in there. You get some PVs on the roof. The demand is pretty low. You ought to be able to begin to match that with heat pumps, you could retrofit heat pumps. And then they can link into the wider network uh, in terms of electrical supply and exchange. Uh, I mean, when I talk battery packs, the Tesla battery packs, two containers. Um, so I think what interests me is, you know, this step back to where we might have been uh, with some of Corb's earlier work, uh, with the Glasgow School of Art, uh, and with Frank Lord Wright, thinking about the building, its location, its position, its orientation, uh, and you know how that building should actually respond. It's a more responsive building, and it uses the building to modify the environment. So the engineering systems are sort of properly integrated into it and, and aren't there you know, simply to um, allow this uh, you know, sort of highly glazed, uh, un- you know, responsive sort of facade that everybody seems to be attracted to, to, to continue and, and be maintained. Uh, I'll, um, I'll let you guess which of those schemes actually won an architecture award. I'll just move on now to, um, I think by the way, just, I do mention the term resilience there. I think that's the other important thing because if we are, beginning to think about global warming and we are potentially experiencing increasing temperatures. You know, it's the air conditioned building which will survive that, It'll just pump more energy into it. But, um, you know, it's, it's the other buildings uh, which, you know, have the potential maybe to, uh, you know, with their ventilation systems and their orientations to be able to manage that as, you know, for the building to manage that uh, increase in temperature. Okay, Nearly finished. I'm just, uh, I'm just going to touch on um, on uh, new homes. Uh, the uh, plan for Manchester is to adopt a passive house standard. Um, 
I would say passive house, but I say passive design and detail there because it really isn't just about adopting standards. A lot of people think if you get the insulation right, you get a triple glazed windows, you get a mechanical ventilation system, you've done passive house. No, you haven't. It's all about the detailing. It's all about continuity of insulation. It's all about the air tightness. It's about avoiding cold bridges and the like. And, and it's the same sort of uh, attention to that sort of detail which reflects in, in, in retrofits. So you're looking for excellent fabric performance. I say it's tried and tested there. This has been about uh, around since there. Sorry, there. There are new build schemes uh, on the left in the UK. Uh, the original uh, scheme there, uh, Passive House scheme, 1991. So they've been around quite a long time, nearly nearly 20 years now. They perform well, they're tried and tested, and they've got some modelling which actually works. Uh, it produces a healthy uh, environment. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's also, we also look at, you know, issues of solar gain and orientation and uh, and summertime overheating uh, and coupled with renewable energy and storage you know you've got the makings of something towards towards zero carbon and um, so let's just sort of think about you know how do we deliver at scale here that's the challenge for us isn't it we've talked about digital today we've talked about pre-manufactured elements and off-site construction you know, it's, it's quite possible. Funny enough, I got something through on my phone today, a conference in Switzerland, which is all about uh, smart facades, and it includes a section on retrofit. So, you know, we can think about how we can get onto some of these buildings and maybe, you know, <laughs> Charlie may not disagree, but some element of off-site construction or partial off-site construction, particularly on commercial buildings, and use of robotics. So there are new skills to be learned and new opportunities. So I'll close uh, uh, finally. I'll just refer back to that quotation from 1972. Should we not be moving towards ways of design and maximising contribution to the building? Yes, indeed, I absolutely agree. I think we need a new architecture. We need to be creating well-tempered environments, but we need to be able to respond to the pressing needs of our age, which is the need to reduce our energy and carbon outputs and, uh, and reduce the uh, effect of global warming. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. A little more comfortable if you take a seat down there. Um, right, five words. New architecture, new business model. Right. Russell Smith. Seven words, sorry. Do you want to give me a deadline? Um, <laughs> you don't have to. 323. Uh, uh, 43. <laughs> okay, so. Shit, did I take a bit too long? Hi. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, non-technical stuff. Um, when you talk about retrofit, uh, I mean, Roger's hinted at quite a few things that are massively important about retrofit. I'm not going to talk about the technical stuff. I'm going to talk about the fact of why, why it hasn't been done at scale yet. And hopefully an idea that we can all latch on to to, to turn that on its head. Um, title's very similar to a talk I gave for David in Nottingham. I've changed the word flaccid to limp because I thought I might be on the nose in Manchester if I used that word. Um, if you're doing one house, there's a lot of things that you, you have to do to make sure that customer is happy when you've got a finished retrofit, okay? Um, and unfortunately, if you do all of those well, it, it means you have to involve a, a number of different people. What we don't do well in construction is involving a number of different people and interfacing them well with each other to end up with a result that's satisfactory for the customer. Um, when I do retrofit, um, I make sure that every property, no matter what we're doing at that time, has a whole house strategy in place. You want to be able to put the budget together with a design in order to make sure you've got something that's affordable. Um, you want to, no matter how small that project. And the list goes on. We need to make sure that every single one of those elements has something that suits the householder, suits the project, to end up with the result that is satisfactory for everybody. Um, that constitutes an offer. What we do not do well at all, and we are talking retrofit here, but actually it could constitute new build as well, is say to someone that doesn't really want to do this, that is amazing, I want to buy it. What we do is we go to someone with a bunch of loft insulation, mm -hmm. and we say, is your loft been insulated or not? Oh, it's full of crap, I'm sorry, I can't do it. Or something. Or, if your local authority put together an area-wide retrofit scheme, you say, OK, well, let's come up with 10,000 identical leaflets and put them through everyone's door and see if it brings us up on our free phone number. That's a retrofit scheme. And no wonder we haven't really done it. 
all right? It's about this offer. And that offer could be 20,000 different offers in Manchester, frankly, to get 20 different segments of customers that would all say, I want to buy now. We don't have an industry that could cope with that yet. If you're trying to get individual houses done at scale, you know, there are a number of different key parts of that process which you have to make sure are right to make sure that job is done well. Um, solutions to identifying the fact that energy is not saved. We talked about a performance gap. I'm not going to go into that again. You know, if, you do it, if, you, if the quality of the work is inadequate, yeah, sure, the energy won't be saved, but the structure of the house will be inadvertently, adversely affected. The internal air quality will be detrimentally affected. If you specify the wrong stuff, let's go back to basics, you might not get your eco-funding at the end of the project. Um, it, it's an ineffective investment. And Mrs. Miggins tells everyone on their street not to bother. That's the opposite of trying to get retrofit going at scale. And one thing that we do tend to forget about is blocking future opportunities. That bit of loft insulation done in the wrong way means nothing else could get done in that loft for 15 years. The kitchen going in without the internal wall insulation, that's that room blighted for internal wall insulation for the next 11 years on average. So it's integrating industry is a massively important part of this stuff to take advantage of the opportunities. And then we have to talk about a scale. So to try and counter those problems, have a decent quality regime. Get the design right. A design as part of every retrofit. Something that Peter Rickaby out there is working on with the past 2030, 2035 standard that's going to be coming in soon from BSI. Procuring it, even if it's just one small part of one house. The procurement means doing very sensible things to make sure the person doing that work for you is qualified. They'll come back and sort it out if it's not been done well. All that kind of stuff. The appropriate package of work is kind of linked to the right design, but that's actually something that a designer might not get their head around because it's about strategy for the house. Can you afford to pay for it? Are, there, are those right mixes of measures to be, achieve the performance that you want? Coordination of all those things. Somebody that knows all of that stuff, but not 100%, but knows what bad looks like. Somebody else might be designing a very specific part of it, but they need to spot when they're not doing it well. And at scale, we need to understand that strategic view of a whole area is important so that you can understand what the offer is for all of the houses that need to get across the line and what each of those things are appropriately for the houses that are likely to come forward in terms of the work that's required. So, I've already touched on why retrofit schemes haven't really worked in the past. I'll, I'll just stick, I'll stick at a couple here. Um, multiple layers, I call them vampire costs, but parasites that build up schemes and suckle the money out before it's reached the householder. Plenty of that going on. Scheme design is never built around the customer. So again, touching on my point about the offer, making sure that's the thing that somebody wants to buy. No budget for marketing. Those people who've ever done any work uh, for local authorities or, or whatever at scale, there ain't no money for marketing. No wonder we only end up with a leaflet. Um, and measures are chosen based on volume and cost, not appropriateness for the long term. Um, those people that work in the eco-funding world, you know, there's a lot of people focused on selling the one individual measure that might end up making the most money, not necessarily what that house really needs to reduce its bills in the long term. We all know about it, we can't really do anything about it, or can we? So. Look at it from the point of view of some people that might actually want to do this work and spend their own money on it. David Kemp mentioned this earlier on. There's potentially 30,000 people in Greater Manchester that are at that stage, literally about to take the money out of their pocket to the person that knows how to do this for them. They're not aware of these measures. They're not aware of the benefits. There's a huge amount of education that needs to happen. But however, even if they were getting to that particular point, they've, they've spoken to someone they trust that's convinced them it's worth it. They don't necessarily have the confidence in the supply chain to do it well. That's a big barrier. Practitioners, sorry for the white van, and you know where I'm coming from. They've got the capabilities, but they've got limited confidence in the market. I don't know any contractor that wants to do a bad job, okay? Very, very rare that you want to find somebody that wants to do a bad job. But they might be ignorant of, of the opportunity. And if they're ignorant of the fact that these customers might want to do it, they won't sell the opportunity either. So there's this catch-22 going on. Um, I know plenty of householders that have been given one of our home energy master plans over the last 15 years, and they've been talked out of doing anything really meaningful to the home by the builder, because the builder doesn't quite know what it's on about. So they don't promote it, don't invest in their own business. 
And even if they did, if they got over that line, they're convinced they still need help pretty much on every job to do, to do that job well. And I'm going to introduce, introduce this new bunch over here on the left called advocates. And these can be charities, local authorities, social landlords, private landlords, could be an estate agent. These are people that understand the constituency of people that need to have this done. They know what flicks their switch. They know how to make that offer, but they have strug they struggle to convene a supply chain. Um, so Retrofit Works is a cooperative that sits in the middle of all that, and it's owned by the left and the right-hand side of that, that slide there, a multi-stakeholder co-op. Typically, you might expect the co-op to be all the dairy farmers that get together and say to Waitrose, we've got all the milk, give us a good price, please. It's kind of that but not quite. The advocates own it too. So they say to the supply chain, we want this market to be shaped in this way for us on behalf of these people we represent. So we want the scheme to be defined in a certain way. So in that sense, it doesn't need a local authority to have a, an at-scale model. It's good to have it because a local authority is a local trusted brand. It doesn't need anything in particular that you might have expected things to be like in, in, in the past. It can be about what we think people want to buy. And I think that's the, that's, that's, the, that's the opposite end to the way we've normally thought about retrofit. Certainly the opposite way around to the way Green Deal was designed. But I want to introduce finance down the bottom there. There's billions upon billions available to be lent into the home improvement market out there now. And I've spoken to several banks that are ready to lend, but they don't have a reliable model on which they can see a, a low risk way of retrofitting in order to part with that cash. But I think we're getting to that point now, and hopefully you'll, you'll be convinced by the time I've got to my seven minutes. I'm going to put two words up there. Um, I know they both conjure up dreadful things for various different reasons. Uh, Grenfell was actually all about a completely missing chain of custody in terms of design, product selection, uh, and uh, implementation of the works. It just completely fell apart. And it, it's not unique. It's just that not everybody else has got away with it so far. Um, what I'm trying to do with the retrofit works model is to make sure we have that chain of custody every single time. Carillion, I've been told several times not to use this phrase, but I, I consider retrofit works as carillionic irrigation for the industry. <laughs> trying to get out of this whole notion that what we've got is a bunch of people that are actually doing the work, but they're sort of shat on from up high by people that have won the work and add no value to the situation at all. And by the way, when things go wrong, the directors stuff their mouth full of gold, disappear off into the higher list, they're, they're still fine. We've got to get rid of both those two situations because what we've got is a lack of trust within industry for both of those two key reasons. And I believe Retrofit Works has got the opportunity to do that. And all these people agreed. They helped get the model off the ground. They funded the development of it. I wrote to them all when the Green Deal first was first mooted, and I ended up with 75 companies from their membership in a room in Westminster, and we just said, we don't know what to do, how should we work it out? And gradually over a period of 18 months, we came up with the model that Retrofit Works is today. And Roger, the RIBA is on there, believe it or not. <laughs> I'm gonna flash through a couple of boring texty things. Uh, they're on the slides, I'm sure David will circulate them afterwards. But the whole idea of this is to say, uh, well, under Green Deal, the relationship was here. Customers had a contract with the Green Deal provider. And the Green Deal provider did everything from the top down and told everyone how they shall behave. Our model is to use these African members to say, we know these customers, we know what they want to buy, we work with these contractors and we'll shape the offer. We might go to a Green Deal provider after that and say, well, we want your finance. And we want to repay it through our energy meter back to an energy company. But chances are we won't. We want to go to the market, work with somebody that's got a consumer credit license and come up with any kind of finance because this is as much part of the offer as the way these people behave and what tech they're going to install. So in a nutshell, we need to understand if this is one street or Trafford, whatever, that there are these people that have very different motives for sticking one piece of loft insulation into their house. Same bit of loft insulation, multiple benefits. And they'll be triggered by their benefit that they recognise. I do it because it reduces carbon emissions. But if I went to this lady here and said, oh, you're going to save the planet, love. She'd go, piss off, I can't afford to heat my house. 
But if I explain it in the way that they're going to react to it, that's what we're going to get. We're going to start getting traction. But there's no way, when we get to scale, that I could possibly come up with a model that would make sure all these people individually feel loved. Only these people can do that, the advocates. So they are the members on one side, the practitioners on the other. And a vetted supply chain is a very bland way of saying we make sure everybody is good. And I can, I'm pleased to announce for the first time that Retrofit Works will be a Trustmark scheme uh, within a couple of weeks. We've been given the nod on that. So the Retrofit Works machinery makes all that work. And I'll go into the detail of what that is very shortly. So advocates effectively have a number of roles. They can just feed in leads. We've got some charities in North London, for instance, that really have no clue about Retrofit at all they know where people want to do this stuff and they've got a few quid and they give us their details and we work with them, GDPR permitted. They can act as a scheme host. They can do a little bit more, a bit more competence. They can give some advice and then when it gets to the point of design, they hand it over. Or actually, if you've got an advocate group that's got a bunch of DEAs and a couple of retrofit coordinators, they can actually do most of the work themselves. And the contractors love that because the sales job is done. The, the householder, their expectations are at the right level we can crack on with a really good job. And practitioners, uh, they're all about delivery, but interestingly, especially in the London project, that if I get time to explain about, which we've got going on at the moment, 90% of the customers are coming from our supply chain because they've already got the relationship in place. And so there's a number of different functions within the customer journey. These are all defined within our online platform, actually. Uh, so effectively, you could get any one of these positions, a uh, particular uh, member of the co-op, or even an external funder, they've got access to our online platform, they can see individual jobs, and they can see what success looks like. And I'm going to talk about the retrofit coordinator very briefly. This is again, I've mentioned it already, this is, the, this is someone that knows 90% of everything. This is the person that will not be gas safe registered, but they'll know what a bad heating system looks like. You'll know that a boiler should be a bit smaller in a house that's got lots of insulation in it. The, you know, the basics, but they know how to make it all chime. Commercially savvy is very important. They know what a high price is. They know how to negotiate a bit to get the price down because they're doing it on behalf of the householder here. They're not doing it. They're the, sort of, they're the third party impartial person. The problem is they're like hen's team. Getting somebody that's got all that sort of gubbins going on in their head is really tough. And if they haven't got it naturally, it takes quite a lot of training to make it happen. But these are really, really important people. Uh, I'll flash through this. This is on our website. This is about what it means to be a, be a member. We've got a number of companies that are just associate members rather than full members. And Erico, who are here, are one of those. Kingspan are associate members as well. And all of our things, like our membership principles, are, are, are on, the, on the website. The key thing about it is um, when you join, you are already in contract with everybody else. There's a minimum standard by which you will say, I am working with, it, with everybody else within this car. We're under contract with each other. What you need to do is design service level agreements around an individual scheme. And that's defined by those advocate members that I told you about. And the entry into the cooperative is aligned with all of the things you might expect to be out there in the, in the industry already. So if one of our members comes along to me and says, I'm a, I'm a member of the Electrical Contractors Association, that's, that's lined up with about 95% of all of our membership criteria. So I say, well, fine, give me a certificate. Just fill out these f final few bits of our criteria, and you're in. Um, PAS 2030, PAS 2035, I can assure you we're already lined up with that. That's not even out yet. And the thing is, this each hand counts review, something that's obviously government's been working on. I can't go into how slow it's been and all that stuff, but ultimately, uh, the code of conduct that's within that is our membership criteria. So our members could already say, when it comes out in October, that they are aligned with the new government standard. Our scheme design, um, it's, it's basically, for the Mayor of London's project, we're doing a thousand home retrofit, and it's a five-page contract. The mayor's, the mayor's team, uh, my own team, and all the, ad, all the co contractor members are all signed up to a five-page document to deliver that. So it's very simple. It's just a layer on top of our existing membership. So effectively, you might expect you know, a standard commercial arrangement would be a tender document and a standard form of contract. We replicate those things just within our standard membership. So by joining, you're under contract. Where we nuance that is within the scheme design. And that scheme design, design might be, we want scaffolders with, with pink skirts on every day. Or it might be, 
if we're doing a scheme in, in Bath, that everyone's got to go on a one-day training scheme on how not to bugger up a Bath State building. Very unique situation. That's what that scheme determines. You don't go on that course, you're not on the scheme. These are reflected, if you want, in a tender document in the JCT, but effectively, we add, we, we've, uh, we've elevated what that would normally be with specifications, code of conduct, use of the online portal for the QA, which I'll go into in a bit. There's no competent person scheme for loft uh, insulation in the UK or under insulation, so we've effectively recreated one within our modelling. We've got an online platform which enables me to be able to know at what stage every job is on, what stage is that? If I'm out on my bike, I know that there's one live round the corner. I'll go and have a look and have a look at the insulation in that wall before the plaster was put over it, not in the usual situation, which is at the end. All our contractors pre-price their work before they've seen any houses, so I broadly know when I'm discussing with a house owner what the job's going to cost. I could go to a house and give them three quotes for a boiler installation before I've left the house, using three local contractors. That's a quite a nice offer. Yeah? Back to this, this offer situation, yeah? Wouldn't it be great if you could go into a house and offer somebody a price from five local contractors for glazing? We could do that. Um, this, the smartphone <coughs> app that's issued to the individual competent person that's on site in that house, so we know who's done the job, they record before, during, and after photos of each phase of the job that they carry out, including photos of all the sign-off documentation at the end. That gives me the confidence to pay them instantly. Mm. So in effect, we're checking 100% of jobs digitally, and then we'll go back and look at the worst ones. Not what Ofgem off requires under ECO, 5%, no other definition. Look at 5% of stuff, of you know, each discipline, to be fair to them. So we'll look at all of the worst ones, but 100% of all jobs. And it's about the customer journey to me, so we, we replicate the customer journey every time, but who does that is nuanced under the scheme design. This particular example scheme was the smart home scheme in North London, and we decided under this arrangement, well, in, in conjunction with Harringay Council, they were generating all the leads, so that was nice for us, and Retrofit Works staff did most of that work ourselves. So the contractors, they just had to basically, well, it was the DEAs that did this element here, the contractors were just told, this lady wants to go ahead, you've got the job. It's yours to, to, to turn down if you want to. But we did all the benchmarking of prices to know they're not taking the mickey with the price when it comes back. It gave everyone a nice, consistent volume of work, particularly boiler installers who like to play golf in the summer because they haven't got anything else to do. And one of the great things about the work we're now doing with social landlords that are joining the co-op, we have three-year term contract with those guys. We can offer them much lower prices in the summer because of that exact situation because Mrs. Miggins doesn't think she needs to be warmer in the winter when it's summer. So evening out the, the workload for the supply chain is massively important. <clears throat> We've got lots of guidance documents. You would be amazed the amount of external wall insulation contractors that think their competent person scheme is doing a planning application for them. This is real. Enfield Council have had one planning application ever for external wall insulation. If you drive around Enfield, you'll see it's littered with external wall insulation. There's a massive disconnect, and I'm sure some of these things are going to come back to bite us. I mean, Preston's obviously a very obvious problem that's, that's arisen, but some of these things are, are kind of hidden. We're not even touching on them. I've written a specification for the three internal wall insulation um, sort of techniques that we're, we, we want to install within Retrofit Works. We're the only people in the country at the moment installing wood fibre board internal wall insulation under ECO. Boring stats, these are our members at the moment. You'd be surprised how few good contractors you need to run a very big scheme. If they're good and they can handle volume, and it doesn't, I'm not even talking about massive amounts of volume, you don't need a lot of contractors. And it's really great when we've got a model that means we don't need a main contractor. So all of the people that do work for us are what you would expect to be subbies, but we deal directly with them. Normally, when they're working for a main contractor who's charging this, subbies are being paid this, we do that. <coughs> That percentage is, we, we charge that to the contractor at the end, but that's agreed by everybody, including the funder. Where are we? So we've got this three and a half million pound programme with the Mayor of London at the moment. Um, that's predicated on quite a large amount of eco, which I'm actually getting more, more eco than I expected, which is good. But my problem now is I can't spend the Mayor's money quickly enough, and I'm getting told off for that. You can't win. Um, eco schemes are being rolled into that actually now. 
We're doing some work on the south coast with Brighton and Hove Energy Services Co-op, so that's an advocate member down there. They are the trusted advisors to those householders down there. They're very cool because they offer a page you save loan as well to bridge the gap between eco, eco funding and, and the actual cost. There's Sutton Housing there and Optivo, they're our uh, social housing members. We've got some really good work we're going on for them and, and one of the things about Optivo, they want secondary glazing at scale in the centre of London and there's one member that we've got for that so we're working with them and their tenants to train them up to create a workers' co-op. That's much more work than I've expected it to be but maybe I'm just massively naive. Um, Oxford and Oxfordshire is launching in, in September and that's a partnership with the Low Carbon Hub. Again, a not-for-profit uh, community energy co-op that is going to be uh, uh, creating, if I can convince them, a, uh, a green bond from the local community to, to, to pump money back into this. And we've heard already from David about this, the Hayes project. I'm quite excited about that. We're not in and of that project. We're not going mad on numbers. We want to do it right. The key thing that's missing for that, from us, we've got to work through is how we get a number of people that are going for a deep retrofit on site that are all within one contract. And that, that's, that's the holy grail for me. Uh, how the electrician that's drilled, drilled a hole through that wall makes sure they go back and fix it and they don't expect someone else to do it, which normally would happen if they were looking and want a job run by a main contractor. So all the little things like that that gets everybody at loggerheads with each other. And we kind of, kind of find a way of making that work. Under, in, a, I used, in a previous life, I did work on motorways, and there was a gain share, pain share type of contract. And I'm, I'm working on something on that basis there, but it's going to require lawyer fees, and I'm already wincing at that. So um, I think what we've got is something that is a, is a platform that enables people to do what they want to do. In other words, people that can be focusing on the thing that they do best, rather than shoehorning their resistance into a finance mechanism or, or some grants that are out there that have to tick boxes in a certain way. Using this kind of approach, the idea is you can try and find what, what, what people want to buy, you retrofit the home in the way that that home tells you what it wants to be done. And then you, you, you build a scheme around it on that basis. If it were to be something that went, went to, that worked within Manchester, Greater Manchester at scale, people wouldn't even need to know that retrofit works existed. Unless you felt that there was some kind of brand that needed to come in and say, right, we're gonna take hold of this by the scruff of the neck. It hasn't got an ego of its own. It's meant through there just to be the, the, the grease that wheels everything else. Mm -hmm. So it might well be the, to give an example, the Greek Cypriot Women's Association of North London have a scheme that deals with 93 little old ladies in North London. Because the, those 93 little old ladies only trust that association. And we've trained them up to give energy advice, and so it goes. So it's about thinking mm -hmm. it from that perspective. A um, lot more in the, on the website, and I'm here to answer questions. Okay, thanks. thanks. So can we take a seat? Thank you very much. Okay, I have allowed both of you to go on a little longer than, uh, than, than planned. No, no, it was, it was <laughs> very interesting. And um, I think uh, a very uh, interesting, you know, we're taking this long-term view from Roger's perspective. We're talking about buildings, what they mean to us and how we've used them or not used them properly. Um, and with, with Retrofit Works, Russell, I think it's just remarkable that notwithstanding the fact that the Green Deal was not a failure and that the eco is a shadow of what it was, actually, your model is growing. Mm. and it's gaining traction just at the time where just about every other market-led initiative in the sector is sort of dying fairly painful death so it must surely have legs um let's hope so so um other questions from uh, from the floor for either roger or russell whilst you're thinking um i'll i'll, I'll put one on myself to myself find a magic wand and I could solve a problem for either of you around this challenge. What, what problem would you want to be solved? Sorry to put you on the spot. It's one thing. I, I think I'd quite like uh, a, a, just a greater level of energy literacy uh, amongst homeowners and, and uh, architects. building occupants. That, oh, yeah, okay. I didn't want to say it, set next to you. Well, but I, I, I mean, I think the problem with architects is they seem to have sort of switched off, particularly when it comes to engineering and that. Um, facade design, everything, it's mm. like there's a specialist out there that will handle all that for yep. me. Yep. So um, they, they, uh, there was a great, uh, great phrase I heard the other day about uh, engineers looking and seeing opportunities and, and architects seeing it, it, this is in terms of sustainability and building performance 
engineers see opportunities, architects see restrictions in trade. And, and I, I find that quite bizarre, really, because because actually the restriction is in trade is this is this sort of um, uh, almost headless um, approach to commercial buildings, which is you know it's got to be air conditioned, it's got to be highly glazed, and it's got to have you know mm. so it's. And, and I think architects need to need to sort of come back and start rethinking you know the position that they used to be in, which was which was understanding how buildings perform and mm. how a building is very very important in how yep. how, it, how it performs. And, and sort of see things in a proper context. Yep. And I'm just sort of trying to illustrate here that you know some of that thinking is beginning to appear again, and it mm. needs to be encouraged. And whether it is actually being encouraged, I think is a matter of time. But the RIBA are seriously addressing this at the moment mm. uh, because we're looking at the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals. Yes. I'm on the RIBA's Ethics and Sustainable Development Commission, and uh, and we really over the next year or so we're going to sort of put. A lot more in place in terms of training, in terms of addressing the the award scheme, mm. which tends to reward, you know, this this you know same old same old. Yep. You know, it's it's not it's not appreciating you know the sort of a sustainable approach to architecture mm. and and how important that is. So um, that's uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Mm. I'm not disagreeing with you. <laughs> Architects <laughs> need to be more. Calm Thank you. Let's take a, a question. Just, well, just to answer that, uh, my name is Rick. I'm from Boyle. Uh, although I'm a home manager. Come back on that. You disagree? Well, no, no I absolutely agree. You know, we, we, we need to get better at what, what we're doing. We need we need to understand how you know buildings should be engineered and 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 have that in our in our in our thinking. It's going back to basics. Right. I, mean, I, I, I used to teach at uh, NMU uh, a while back, and I used to talk about food. About, oh, I just watched a good Ramsey program where he went to a restaurant, and this guy was saying he was, he was cooking Michelin star food. I think my, my point was was actually about homeowners really not knowing how the thermostat works, uh, mm. not knowing that it is okay to open a window at the right time. That, that, some of that stuff, I mean, uh, would probably filter through to the brains of architects too. But if everybody knew that, they'd be asking the right questions of their builders and their architects in the first place, and then they'd, within that catch twenty two that I was alluding to would disappear. Okay, Dave Kemp, you have the honour of the final question. Oh God, no, really? There's something more intelligent. <laughs> um, not, not suggesting it's not going to be intelligent. Yeah, Russell, you obviously know this stuff and you've got your contracts in London and you've got these schemes that are delivering you know, some very, very significant numbers and some very significant revenue. Mm. Uh, what are the main challenges as you envisage them or as you perceive them in terms of the Hayes project and engaging with Manchester contractors? Is there a different dynamic with you know, sub regional construction companies? or? I think the first thing I always say if I go anywhere to talk about this is I don't know Manchester so I, I rely on everybody else to give me a clue to start um, I'm led to believe that the, that, that the supply chain in Manchester is probably going to be hard work um, now I think there's two flavours of supply chain that I would want to work with the first is those people that think they're really specialist at e uh, energy efficiency stuff and they've probably been doing it wrong in a high volume for quite a long time. And we need to nudge them along to do the right things. And there are really good contractors out there that think this is a crap market to be in. And we need to convince them that that's the wrong, wrong place as well. I'd love to be in a situation where you've got kitchen contractors in installing insulation. Now, they might not be actually installing. They might be you know, picking the phone up to one of our members to come and do it at the right time. 
And once you've knitted all of those individual opportunities, whether it's the extension or kitchen fitter or bathroom fitter or whatever, that's actually quite a lot of decent work for somebody who's really good at installing insulation into a house. And it's at the right time. It's at a moment where the household is willing to accept the hassle. They've probably got the money. Uh, and if you don't do it then, it ain't going to happen for 20 years. So I, that that's not directly answering your question, because I'm not able to, actually. Until I've sat down with a few of you in the room and worked out what we could do in Manchester. I think if you come in saying I've got the answer, well, then you're just you're just completely wrong. You've got to learn from what the industry needs, as well as well. That, as I said earlier on, the house tells you what it needs. You should do the same for everybody else that's involved. Um, so it, we're going to have to do a lot of have a lot of coffees. <laughs> I think it's important to say. I, I think I'm okay to say that we're going to offer some retrofit coordinated training as part of that program. Um, so there will be an upskilling opportunity. Mm. Um, which uh, will we'll, uh, be news on in due course. Okay, I think, oh, yeah. Sorry, final question. Yeah, a little cheeky one in there. Um, on the retrofit coordinator training side, I think particularly on what you're talking about, is um, one of the things we've really suffered with, uh, even on a single project, we've moved through sort of three bunches of contractors. Um, we're finding retention of skills being one of the most difficult things. Lots of time invested getting high quality contractors, trying to be multi skilled with them. using uh, air tightness champion and other terminologies to mm. help um, you know, pick the one or two out of the bunch to, to smooth over projects and get the best results. The difficulty being that as soon as you come to call again for another project, another scheme, they're gone, they're nowhere to be found. And this very much ties back to a lot of the subcontracting mm. nature of the, the industry, which in Manchester particularly is very severe. And I'm wondering how, how that's going to be It's, it's about volume. Um, if you want to start getting grip on quality, you've got to say, it's not about guarantees and warranties and all that crap that Green Deal was on about. It's about saying, I've got 50 jobs for you if you do this one well. And if you stuff it up, you're out. And it's the same argument with the, the people that you've been working with. You know, you've got to try and hopefully work with others to be able to say, we're cultivating a market beyond that one house. And whole house retrofit is tough. It is tough. And my problem has been similar to yours, actually, in, the, in London. Uh, if you find a good contractor, you train them up to do something really well, they just go off and do it. They don't need me anymore. Um, and suddenly they're doing a three and a half million, house pa uh, three and a half million pound house in Fulham. And, uh, you know, and that's, you know, they're everywhere. Um, so they don't, they, I don't want to do those. Um, so it's, it's not a problem. That's a nice thing, I think. We're growing the market in this stuff. Um, it's just hard work for the people on the, uh, at the coalface and just have to get used to it. <laughs> hard work. Would you mind just pass me the progressor, Russell? Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, Russell and Roger. Uh, it's fascinating. I mean, you, you know, stuff is going to start happening now with this Hayes programme, and that's really important, mm. and with Regfit Works. Um, uh, it brings us to the end of today. I'm very grateful to those of you who stayed uh, on. Um, if I could just ask you to return your badges on the way out, there's a little box of the registration desk just so we can recycle, uh, and also the meeting passports if you've been using those. Uh, the presentations and videos, we have filmed today, um, and we will make those available to you as soon as we can. The presentations very shortly, the videos I'm not quite sure on yet. Um, if you've met someone today and you had an interesting conversation but you didn't get their business card or you can't remember who it was, then drop me a line and if I can uh, help to reintroduce you, I will. Uh, my contact details are down at the bottom uh, and on many emails that you've had from me. Um, I'd encourage you to stay engaged uh, with us, so please follow us on Twitter. In fact, do it now. Why not? <laughs> Before you forget, it's at build re underscore rev. Um, and we have further Build Revolution events planned in the, uh, in the, in the back end of the year. Not, um, not quite so local, but we'll certainly be uh, hoping to be back uh, next year, uh, see how things have moved on and provide you with much more updates. But a big thank you to all of our speakers, to our sponsors, to the University of Salford uh, and to Arico. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for coming and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Jensen. Cheers. Cheers, I didn't quite realise that was on, so I'm probably not in shot for most of the time. The camera. I don't know how to do that, to be honest. <laughs>